Guys, we're ready. And guess what? I'm just facilitating, people. I'm just here to facilitate because these brothers are going to <clears throat> be doing all the talking. They got slides. They got quotations. And they're going to introduce themselves. Now, don't forget, answering Adventism did a <clears throat> session for us about two weeks ago. He's got his own YouTube channel. And he's a third generation Adventist whose father is a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But I'm going to let him share his story, and then his brother in the Lord, our brother in the Lord, tell us a little about himself, and they take it from there. Guys, I'm going to recede in the background. The Holy Spirit fill you and anoint you to glorify Jesus Christ by speaking truth without error, so that seven-day Adventists will come to the true God and see that Ellen G. White is a tool of the devil, no better than Joseph Smith and Muhammad, the Lord Jesus be magnified in and through you. So take over, brethren. I'll be in the back. Amen. Amen. I uh, I will keep it short because, as Sam said, I was here a couple weeks ago. A lot of you guys are regular viewers, so you already know a little bit about me. If you want to hear more about me, you can go and listen to the two-part sessions that we did over on my channel or they're on Sam's channel, um, and you can hear about my background. But like Sam said, I am a former third-generation Seventh-day Adventist. So is my friend Colin here. And as Sam mentioned on the last show, we were going to do a show specifically dedicated to prophecies, specifically regarding Ellen White and her supposed prophecies. So that's what we're going to get into tonight. But before CMB, give a small introduction. All right. What's up, everybody? Grace and peace. My name is uh, CMB, the ambassador. Um, I am also a third generation uh, former Seventh-day Adventist. Um, my dad is not a pastor, so <laughs> a little bit different in that regard, but um, I was also born and raised in the culture. Um, very, very similar backgrounds. Uh, Miles and I were able to collect, uh, to uh, connect on multiple levels. You know, I'm just kind of sharing uh, background information and just kind of, you know, just kind of uh, really reliving some of the memories, you know what I mean, um, through the church uh, organization. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I live in Ohio now and, um, the Lord has been blessing, you know, I've been out for almost 20, well, actually this year, I think we'll make it 20 years, 19, 20 years, uh, something like that. So it's been amazing. I was in for, yeah, actually this year would make it 20 years. Uh, I was in for 25 years, the first 25 years of my life, um, probably missed, uh, less Sabbaths than you can count on one hand, you know, <laughs> growing up, uh, in church and so forth then. Um, really kind of not just a nominal SDA, but, you know, really involved in um, just in the culture. So uh, that's how it goes, you know, so a lot to, uh, to share today um, and so forth like that. So I uh, really appreciate Brother Sam for inviting us on again. Um, and Brother Miles is uh, at Adventism. It's great uh, to be with you once again, my brother. Thank you, my friend, and thank you for coming on. So like I said, tonight we're going to tag team. Sam wanted to tag team specifically Ellen White and her false prophecies after we already decimated their terrible theology in those other two sessions. And so as I mentioned, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to read, though, a small snippet from a book called Seventh-day Adventist Believe. This is the official exposition of their own church's fundamental beliefs. So we're going to read a couple excerpts from chapter 18. I don't believe that this is online for free anywhere, or I would link you to it. But it's chapter 18, specifically fundamental belief number 18, which deals with the gift of prophecy regarding Ellen White. So what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to read a, a couple portions out of here, and then I'm going to spend my time going through one single bad prophecy for a number of reasons that I will explain once we get to that point. Uh, but we're going to test these things up against their own standard and, of course, Scripture. So after we do that, I'm going to hand it over to CMB. He'll probably comment along the way. It's not just going to be, I don't want this to just be a monologue. He has a lot to add to this. Um, but along the way, I will explain some things to you, uh, and then we'll eventually transition to him, and he will go over multiple other prophecies, and we'll switch roles, so to speak. So let me read this portion from their fundamental belief. I want to read first the fundamental belief itself for those that don't know. Now this you can look at online. It is adventist.org slash beliefs. I don't have it brought up right now and I don't want to waste time typing. I know it's not very long, but adventist.org slash beliefs. And it's fundamental belief number 18. So I'm going to read the fundamental belief to you first, and then I'm going to read you some of the exposition. So, it, excuse me. So it says, The scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit 
is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. There is then a heading that says, it's on the next page in the Fundamental Beliefs books. For those that have it, it is 254, 254 in the 2015 most recent edition. There's a heading that then says, the functions of the prophetic gift in the New Testament. It says, the New Testament gives prophecy a prominent place among the gifts of the Holy Spirit, once ranking it first and twice second among the ministries most useful to the church. See Romans 12, 6 and 1 Corinthians 12, 28. It encourages believers to desire especially this gift, and the New Testament suggests that the, prof, uh, that the that prophets had the following functions. They assisted in the founding of the church, they initiated the church's mission outreach, they edified the church, they united and protected the church, they warned of future difficulties, and they confirmed the faith in times of controversy. Well then, on the next page, it says, The prophetic gift just before the second advent. Quote, God gave the gift of prophecy to John the Baptist to announce Christ's first advent. So notice the compare and contrast that we're going to get into here. They like to do this a lot. You'll notice we mentioned this in the two previous streams as well. And you're going to see at the end of what I'm going to present tonight too, there's another big parallel that they love to try to make that we're going to show uh, doesn't add up. But I digress. Continuing, it says, In fact, Christ mentions the rise of false prophets as one of the signs of his coming in near. If there were to be no true prophets during the time of the end, Christ would have warned against or Christ yeah Christ would have warned against anyone claiming that gift. His warning against false prophets implies that there would be true prophets as well. The prophet Joel predicted a special outpouring of the prophetic gift just before Christ's return. He said, "And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to uh, turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So that was her or them quoting uh, Joel 2:28 through 31. But then they say, the first Pentecost saw a remarkable manifestation of the Spirit. Peter, citing Joel's pro uh, prophecy, pointing out that God had promised such blessings. However. We may ask whether Joel's prophecy reached its ultimate fulfillment in Pentecost, or whether there must be phenomena, or, uh, or whether there must be another more complete fulfillment. We have no evidence that the phenomena in the sun and moon that Joel spoke of either preceded or followed that outpouring of the Spirit. These phenomena did not occur until many centuries later. So this is a big deal, essentially, in their church. And for those that are not plugged into the culture, I know a lot was said there, but CMB. What was fully said there regarding the remnant church, that this is a mark, an identifying mark of, of said thing? How important is this, what we're discussing tonight, for this to stand for this church? Oh, that's uh, absolutely important. It's uh, essential. Um, what they're doing is throwing up the alley-oop to, to slam dunk the Ellen White uh, ball, if you will. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it is one of those things where if you uh, if you understand kind of the uh, the worldview, you know, of the SDA Church, which we'll get into in a little bit here. Um, if you understand the worldview of the SDA Church, um, yes, prophet prophecy is important, but um, it's not just any prophet. It's again specifically identified as the believing the gift of prophecy as manifested in the uh, life and teachings of Ellen Ellen White. Okay, so you have all of a sudden prophecy, but really honed in on one location. Yep. Yeah, it's not. Who's who's been the other prophet in Seventh Adventism? CMB. The other prophet. Yeah. What yeah. Who, prophet? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. If that gives you the indicative sign, they try to paint it there like it's, oh, it's this, you know, spiritual yeah. gift that, you know, all, you know, and it's right. Scripture says that or Paul says that you should try and long for this, et cetera. Um, mm. But they're using that, like you said, and it's always this way to then scoop up under Ellen and bolster her. Well, then <laughs> if you go to page 259 of that same chapter, we have the main heading, which says post-biblical prophets and the Bible. 
So listen to this. There are a, a number of headings under here. We're only going to read one, and it's the testing the prophetic gift. So this is what we're going to do tonight. It says, because the Bible warns that before Christ's return, false prophets will arise, we must investigate carefully all claims to the prophetic gift. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, Paul said, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. The Bible specifies several guidelines, such as the following, by which we can distinguish the genuine prophetic gift from the spurious. One, does the message agree with the Bible? Then they quote Isaiah 8.20. To the law and the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This text implies that messages of any prophet ought to be in harmony with God's law and testimony. As revealed in the Bible, a later prophet must not contradict earlier prophets. The Holy Spirit never contradicts his previously given testimony. For God does not change like shifting shadows. James 1.17 they list out four more, and I'm just going to read the headings, but tonight we're going to focus on that single one, CMB, that single one, their own standard there. Yeah. The, th the other three are, do the predictions come true? Is Christ's incarnation recognized? And does the prophet bear good or bad fruit? So with that said, I like how they mentioned in the law there too, CMB, um, because Bearing uh, the name of God falsely is what taking the Lord's name in vain is really about. It's a lot more than just saying OMG and using right. the name of God loosely. It's bearing the name of God, saying, God said this, right. God told me, God showed me, and he mm -hmm. didn't really do that. Right. So keep that in mind, folks. I know that this audience is is typically very aware. Um, hey, that guy, uh, he made an appearance in uh, one of my episodes, Sam, Alec Wolf. Hey, Alec, I thought you were being uh, pedantic or uh, just trying to troll me in my email, but hopefully you were being serious. That is awesome. Uh, folks, be praying for this guy. If he seriously did this, this takes a lot of courage, um, especially when your whole family is SDA. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through, at first, a letter. This is a letter that the White Estate and the Seventh Avenue Church tried to suppress for many years. It is regarding what is known as the second vision. Ellen White had her first supposed vision in December 1844. Her second vision was supposedly the middle of February 1845. So three months after this great disappointment, we don't have time to go into all that tonight, folks. If you want to hear an in-depth dive on all that, again, go back and watch the two sessions that I did with Sam. That's a total of five hours. We go at a real granular level on that. But we're going to look at a letter that Ellen wrote to one of the former pioneer or uh, uh, fellow pioneers of the day. His name was Joseph Bates. This guy was very plugged in, very plugged in. The movement probably would not have survived if Bates was not the payroll, because at the time of all of this, these people were really young. Ellen White was 17, 18, 21, 22. These people were very young, aside from this guy, Joseph Bates. Well, in this letter, I'm going to walk you through. We're going to talk about a doctrine that was called and still has a place with uh, the church called the shut door doctrine. This doctrine, like most SDA theology, has evolved and been changed over time in attempts to keep the prophetic ministry alive from Ellen White. So I'm going to read each paragraph of the letter, and I'm going to stop along the way and explain what's going on for the audience. CMB, feel free to chime in at any point. Uh, then I'm going to show you why and how the doctrine evolved in Ellen's own words uh, through more supposed visions mm -hmm. from God that contradicted previous visions from God. And then in this, you're going to see that this uh, SDA church's current stance on this and where they landed and why. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a partial letter. That's all that exists. This was finally posted and released by the White Estate. Um, it's on their website. It's very hard to read. There is a transcript of it. So that is what I'm going to be reading. There's going to be some places, too, where there is bad grammar. I'm just reading it as it was. So there's some bad grammar in there. So I just didn't want to change any of that. So here's the breakdown. Adventists are taught, and Colin, you were probably taught this as well. I don't know for sure, but if you took Adventist heritage and Adventist pioneer studies and those sorts of classes, Adventists are typically taught that Ellen's first two visions that I mentioned corrected erroneous doctrines, such as the one that we're going to talk about tonight, 
that were prevalent among early SDAs. The story was never, oh, the second vision actually corroborated and was actually fuel to the heresy and the false teaching. No, 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 no. It actually corrected right. all that. <laughs> that was the, that's what Adventists are told. But as you're about to see, this is absolutely false. Mm -hmm. This letter confirms that Ellen herself claimed to be given the doctrine of the shut door of mercy in her second vision. And not just that, but this then influenced others to adopt this doctrine because of it, not correcting error. So it starts, quote, remember, she's writing to this guy, Joseph Bates. Brother Bates, you write in a letter to James, her husband, something about the bridegroom coming. As stated in the first published visions, by the letter you would like to know whether I had light on the, bride's on the bridegroom's coming before I saw it in vision. I can readily answer, no. The Lord showed me to, the Lord showed me the travail of the Adventist band and midnight cry in December, but he did not show me the bridegroom's coming until February following. Perhaps you would like to have me give a statement in relation to both visions. So Joseph Bates, this early pioneer in the movement, wrote a letter to James White, Ellen's husband. And he wanted to know if Ellen had read anything about the bridegroom's coming before she supposedly saw it in vision, to which Ellen said no. Hmm. So we will break down this phrase, the <laughs> bridegroom's coming, later on. Yeah. But keep that in mind. One second, brother. Okay. I didn't know James White had a previous life, so he got reincarnated. <laughs> Sam, you pulled that you pulled that stunt <laughs> last time. <laughs> but we'll break down this phrase, the bridegroom's coming, later on. It pertains to how they interpret Matthew 22 and the parable of the bridegroom. She continues, At the time I had the vision of the midnight cry, I had given it up in the past and thought it future, as also most of the band had. So she says that she had given up the vision of the midnight cry, in the past, and thought it was still future as most of what was known as the little flock. She uses the word band here. Mm -hmm. She's referring to this early, early Advent group between 44 and 63, basically, or even the mid-50s, um, which was known as the little flock. Yeah. The midnight cry is defined by Ellen in her book, Early Writings, on page 260, as the call to prepare people to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This was in the developing stages of what is now called the investigative judgment. Mm -hmm. But at this time, it also included the shut door of mercy doctrine. Great. That is key to understand because when they try to use this still, I always point back to this. They love to try and use Matthew 22 to support only the investigative judgment. <laughs> Doesn't work that way, Adventists. So if anyone watched part two of my discussion with Sam from a couple weeks ago, you'll remember I broke down what the investigative judgment is and its significance to the false date setting of William Miller in 1844. Um, but in short, the claim is that Jesus was only in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary until October 22nd, 1844, and then got up and entered into the most holy place to begin his next phase in the atonement that they think is this long drawn out process. With this came the idea that the door of mercy was shut and no one else could be saved. I'm going to say that again. Yep. <laughs> the door of mercy was now shut. No one else could be saved. In the letter, she says that she and the little flock had given up the shut door as being something that would take place in the future. But then later in the letter, as you're going to see, she explains it actually took place on October 22nd, 1844. They initially believed the shut door, then gave it up, but then her visions had resurrected it as present truth. And she tells Bates later in the letter that they were settled upon the teaching. Uh, so, real quick, my yeah, uh, answering your criticism. Um, did you uh, tell the people what tr present truth is uh, in the last stream? Um, I and did. Just kind of remind the people, if you don't mind. For, for sure. Present truth. Well, go for it. I'll let you talk, son. Well, present truth is uh, their version of uh, relativism. <laughs> yeah. So it's a progressive revelation, you know, so if something yep. is true today, um, present truth means it could kind of trump what happened last time, you know, except for when it comes to the covenants. But that's another story. But we'll, yeah, we'll get it's there. light <laughs> that they basically think has uniquely been given at a certain point. That like it's light that previous generations did not have. So then she continues in this letter. 
quote, I know not what time Jay Turner, she mentions this guy Turner, who's you'll need to pay attention to. He's an important figure here. I know not what time Jay Turner got out his paper. I knew he had one out and one was in the house, but I knew not where uh, what was in it, for I did not read a word in it. I had been and still was very sick. I took no interest in reading, for it injured my head and made me nervous. After I had a vision and God gave me light, he bade me deliver it to the band, again, that little flock, but I shrank from it. I was young, and I thought that they would not receive it from me. So then she mentions this guy, like I said, Jay Turner, and says he had a paper regarding this shut door doctrine. This is key to understand, folks. There were other people that were talking about this supposed shut door thing. <clears throat> there was It was documented in a paper. But she claims she didn't read a word of it because she was very sick and reading injured her head and made her nervous. So very clearly, she didn't want Joseph Bates to think that she picked up this doctrine from this paper right. that was in the house. So she gave the excuse that it injured her head to read. That's what she's saying. here. I know that there was a letter that this is contained in, but I haven't read it. Right. Even though, as you're going to see here, there was a two hour period where she was like alone with the letter. Mm -hmm. I mean, and okay. that's a that's a similar uh, that's a similar thing for the uh, the narrow path vision, what's known mm -hmm. as the narrow path vision. Uh, for those vision, keeping yeah. score at home, it's uh, First Nephi chapter eight in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I mean, whatever you know, it's just uh, kind of. And again, we, we she doesn't plagiarize, but until you look at it side by side, it's like oh, yeah. no. it's like until you see the plagiarism. Yeah, like it's, it's clear as right. day. It's like when you read life <laughs> life sketches of Paul. It's yeah. like. It's, they're like it's a it's a totally different genre it's like yeah until you literally put it side by side and it's like yeah. i don't even know which one i'm reading <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, it's so, ridiculous <laughs> yeah so clearly here she doesn't want bates to know that she read this letter so she's making this excuse that she didn't feel good it injured her head to read so that's why she didn't read this letter and she definitely doesn't know what it contains she then continues i disobeyed the lord and instead of remaining at home where the meeting was to be that night I got in a sleigh in the morning and rode three or four miles, and there I found Jay Turner. He merely inquired how I was and if I was uh, in the way of my duty. I said nothing, for I knew I was not. I passed up chamber and did not see him again for two hours. When he came up, asked if I was to be at the meeting that night. I told him no. He said he wanted to hear my vision and thought it duty for me to go home. I told him I should not. He said no more, but went away. I thought and told these ar or those around me. If I went, I should have come out against his views, thinking he believed with the rest. I had not told any of them what God had shown me, and I did not tell them in what I should cut across his track. So that was a lot, and the grammar's all jacked up in there. But she essentially admits to spending two hours at Turner's home, but keeps on pretending that her vision wasn't influenced by Turner's paper on the shut door that he and Bates both believed in. So this guy Turner and Joseph Bates both believed in the shut door doctrine. Ellen then supposedly has a vision confirming this doctrine, but she was too scared to tell it and claims she hasn't seen this doctrine from anywhere other than the vision that was given to her. So that's where we're at currently. She then goes on to say that she wouldn't be at the meeting that was being held that night and tells others that she was afraid Turner would come out against her, yet in his paper it was very clear that she was right in line with what he claimed to believe. So basically, she got this idea from the paper, then claimed to have, a, have had a vision about it from God, but denies ever having looked at the paper where this idea was being espoused by other people. She continues, All that day I suffered much in body and mind. It seemed that God had forsaken me entirely. I prayed the Lord if he would give me strength to ride home that night. The first opportunity, I would deliver the message he had given me. He did give me strength, and I rode home that night. The meeting had been done for some time, and not a word was said by any of the family about the meeting. So now she mentions missing the meeting over the shut door that had been held that no one in her family told her anything about this new and shocking doctrine that the door of mercy was closed because the end of the world was so near. And she wants Bates to believe that the only access to any information on the shut door that she had were her two early visions. Again, if you heard the session I previously did with Sam, you'll remember how Ellen functioned. 
other people in the movement put forth doctrines, not Ellen. Ellen would then be given visions, supposedly, confirming these said doctrines, giving the stamp of approval from God on the teaching, cementing it into the movement. So that's what's going on here. She wanted Bates to think that the only insight she had into this idea was directly from God, which must mean what the others who are saying about it is true. But she never saw the paper, CMB. She never. And then as you're going to see up here, she's ne she never saw the flyer, Turner's flyer either, that was going around about this. No, no, right. no. No, How no, could she, no, no. Right. absolutely not. <laughs> she was only alone with it again for two hours, you know, and it lines up exactly, exactly. So... So now you're going to see how these two visions swindle this naive little flock of people into believing that the door of mercy is closed forever and that no more sinners can be saved because God supposedly revealed this in vision to Ellen. And then, like I said, after we're done with the letter here, we're then going to go through the years up to 1951 where this circus was going for that long. And you're going to see all the flip flopping back and forth. Mm -hmm. I continue. Very early next morning, Jay Turner called and said he was in haste going out of the city in a short time and wanted I should tell him all that God had shown me in vision. It was with fear and trembling I told him all. After I had got through, he said he had told out the same last evening. So he said, that's, he, that's exactly what I said at the meeting. I was rejoiced, for I expected he was coming out against me. For all the while, I had not heard anyone say what he believed. He said the Lord had sent him to hear me talk the evening before, but as I would not, he meant his children should have the light in some way, so he took him. There, there were but few out when he talked, so the next morning I told my vision, and the band, believing my visions from God, received what God bade me to deliver them. How convenient. She says she stayed away from the home the night of a prayer meeting after being given a vision to share with everyone. But instead, JT gave the sermon and says all the same things that he'd said in his paper that Ellen had been left alone with. But we're supposed to believe she didn't read this paper because she injured her head or it injured her head to read. And <laughs> notice again, the denial of having heard anyone else ever say anything regarding this doctrine. Yeah, She denies again, reading the paper. But as you're about to see, Ellen taught the shut, door, the shut door doctrine based on visions that were used for years in the early days of their movement. And I've emphasized this a number of times now in this short period, because when we get to the end here, you're going to see the claim that the church is making today that is in stark contrast to what we're reading in this letter. She then continues, the view about the bridegroom's coming I had about the middle of February 1845. So that's the second vision. So I mentioned this term, the bridegroom's coming earlier. This is a euphemism for the shut door because Jesus is the bridegroom who'd gotten up and the shut door was what sealed probation for sinners so that no one else could be saved except those who believed this false prophecy that Jesus would come in October 22nd, 1844. This nonsense, again, went on until 1851. Hmm. So as I'm going to demonstrate after, like I said, I'll show the total flip-flopping and that God must be the worst communicator in the world, apparently. So she continues. While in Exeter, Maine, in meeting with Israel Damon, James, her husband, and many others, many of them did not believe in a shut door. I suffered much at the commencement of the meeting, Unbelief seemed to be on every hand. There was one sister there that was called very spiritual. She had traveled and been a powerful preacher most of the time for 20 years. She had been truly a mother in Israel. But a division had risen in the band on the shut door. She had great sympathy and could not believe the door was shut. I had known nothing of their differences. Sister Durbin got up to talk. I felt very, very sad. So why did Ellen feel very, very sad? Did you catch that, CMB? Because Sister Durbin had felt sympathetic for the world and couldn't come to accept the shut door. Ellen was sad that this woman felt heartbroken for the lost. 
You, you know, it's funny. Um, and and I, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the ages of these, uh, the quote unquote pioneers. Um, they are, te- they're kids, right? They're, they're kids. They're, and um, it's not to say that God can't use uh, young people or children, but um, there's a reason that uh, in, you know, Timothy, uh, that Paul really says, listen, you need to make sure that the young women are being mentored yeah. by the older women and the young men are being mentored by the elders. Okay. Um, yes, everyone, uh, you can be used, but you also need to be guided. Um, you can't be out here going rogue um, on your own here, lone wolf in it. I'm um, talking about your preaching and hearing from God, right? Um, this is one of the things that is concerning that they left uh, the safety of their churches, their homes, their families to go follow William Miller. Let's not forget that. Right. And, and even prior to that, I mean, I almost feel bad for Ellen White. Hmm. Um, spirituality, like I said, yeah, she was just like plopped in because folks prior to going into the fanaticism of William of Millerism, which is was fanaticism, right? 100% <laughs> fanaticism of the, of the yeah. age, the zeitgeist of the day. She was a part of the, and we're not going to get into this tonight, but she was a part of the shouting Methodists. Correct. Yeah. Um, so she was just raised in fanaticism. And so it was just one fanatical movement after another. But she continues. She says, at length, my soul seemed to be in in agony. And while she was talking, I so talking about Sister Durbin, while she was talking, I fell from my chair to the floor. It was then I had a view of Jesus rising from his mediatorial throne and going to the holiest as bridegroom to receive his kingdom. Mm -hmm. They were all deeply interested in the view. They all said it was entirely new to them. The Lord worked in mighty power, setting the truth home to their hearts. Sister Durbin knew what the power of the Lord was, for she had felt it many times. And a short time after I fell, she was struck down and fell to the floor, crying to God to have mercy on her. When I came out of vision, my ears were saluted with Sister Durbin singing and shouting with a loud voice. So then she lies, essentially. Because she says everyone thought this idea was new. Yet she knew that others like Turner and Bates believed this doctrine because they had papers saying such that she had clearly known about and seen again. Because again, it wasn't just this Bates paper either. We're not getting into it, but there was a flyer that Turner had as well that was laying out this theory. She continues, this is the final paragraph. Most of them received the vision and were settled upon the shut door. Previous to this, I had no light on the coming of the bridegroom, but had expected him to this earth to deliver his people on the 10th day of the seventh month. I did not hear a lecture or a word in any way relating to the bridegroom's going to the holiest. So finally, we see that the entire push of the Bates letter was to make sure that he knew that Ellen was a shut door believer just like him. And the letter does exactly that. Very clearly, Ellen taught a shut door doctrine that said no one else could be saved. And she taught conflicting things around this until 1851 based on visions, claiming God showed this to her, which makes her a lying false prophet and a blasphemer of God claiming to speak on his behalf falsely. The SDA church likes to try and use the excuse that the biblical prophets often had visions shown to them and they didn't know what they meant and interpreted them falsely. So Ellen's no different. But now let's look at a chronology of quotes, like I mentioned. From Ellen claiming to be shown all of what we're going to re- uh, all of what we will uh, read, it, which is supposedly shown in vision and the major conflicts and contradictions that God was supposedly revealing through her. Uh, what the SDA church has dismissed as merely more present truth being revealed. Essentially, the stuff is supposedly just, oh, it's just present truth. It's like, oh, how convenient. You can always just pivot. It's the never ending trump card. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely convenient, which is sad. Um, and like I said, someone asked earlier, um, does SDA have abrogation? Um, and th- this is it. If, it. if there was such a thing as abrogation, they would never call it that. But those who say it's present truth, you know, um, and it could be a complete 180 of what, what thus saith the Lord or what light came down from glory or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So it, it doesn't matter at that point. And it's just ad hoc. Get let's get this thing done. Let's uh, let's let's quell the the questions of the people yeah you know what i mean um so it's very it's very it's actually pretty shameful if you ask me <laughs> but... 
Yeah. And transparency, but you know, I digress. Well, and you can't even ask, you're not even supposed to ask questions about these things, man. Right. If you start asking questions about these things, I was known at Southern amongst professors, which, well, I'm not going to get into all that. I was, I was known by professors as a, as a, like a, Oh, I don't want that guy in my class. Right. <laughs> and no, it wasn't like I was just being a jerk and whatnot. Mm. They would, they would say, I'll answer that question after class. Come talk to me. Right. We're not going to talk about that in front of everyone. Mm hmm. Well, we, we try not to talk about, you know, that type stuff. That's the attitude around this, because as folks just saw, this is crazy, folks. The yeah. door of mercy shut. Steve Daly in his book. Yes. I don't have the, the sources on that right now. But in Steve Daly's book, he has the source material on this mm -hmm. where he studied and they had roughly placed 150 people. The kingdom of God was 150 people <laughs> at the um, time, I, at the time, I guess, because who knows who'd passed the judgment from everyone else that, you know, right. Well, I mean, it. if you ask her, she says not one in 20. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Your chances you are less than a 5% chance. Yeah, chances <laughs> winning the lottery are basically higher than being saved in this movement. So, Winning the lottery on the day you get struck by lightning. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So this first oh, quote yeah. is from <clears throat> April 21st, 1847. I'm going to put actually a link, all of this stuff, folks. I'm going to share this in the, in the, the chat now. Um, Sam, I'm going to put this in the private chat and then you, uh, if you can share this out, you can go to this. This is the white estates own website. I compiled all of this off of there. The letter was not on there. So now we're going to examine and we're not going to read all this. This, this page is huge. But for those that are interested, after watching this stream, go through and read all this and see how this is all being posi positioned now. You're not going to hear anything on here about what what's actually said in that second vision and that Ellen actually confirmed the teaching with it, not, oh, you guys were wrong and I'm correcting you. No, 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 no. So this first quote you may have to do like a, a control F to skip down into the page. Ellen claims that all, this is in 1847. You could put April 21st, 1847 in your search control F and it should take you to the, the quote. Ellen claims all SDAs who walked away from the movement were eternally lost and the door of mercy was shut forever to them. So specifically the people who walked away from the false prophecies, the Millerite fanaticism. She says, quote, you think that those who worship before the saints' feet will at last be saved? Here I must differ with you, for God shew me that this class were professed Adventists who had fallen away and crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame, and in the hour of temptation, which is yet to come, to show out everyone's true character. They will know that they are forever lost and overwhelmed with anguish of spirit. They will bow to the saint's feet. You also think that Michael stood up and the time of trouble commenced in the spring of 1844. The Lord has shown me in vision that Jesus rose up and, the, and shut the door and entered the Holy of Holies at the seventh month, 1844. But Michael's standing up, Daniel 12, 1, to deliver his people is in the future. This will not take place until Jesus has finished his priestly office in the heavenly sanctuary and lays off his priestly attire and puts on his most kingly robes and crown to ride forth on the cloudy chariot to thresh the heathen in anger and deliver his people. Close quote. That's Ellen G. White, letter two, 1847, page two, and also in the book, A Word to the Little Flock, page 12. But... In true Ellen White fashion, she contradicts these supposed revelations from God and says God showed her another vision that Christ was still interceding and the door of mercy wasn't actually shut. This is now January 5th, 1849. So that previous quote was April 21st, 1847. So we're jumping forward here to the beginning of 1849 now. She says, quote, at the commencement of the Holy Sabbath, that January 5th, I was taken off in vision to the most holy place. How's that, Colin? 
she was just ushered right in like VIP tickets. Right. Just brought <laughs> into the most holy place, like going to a concert. <laughs> right um no no human woman has ever been inside the most holy place on earth and here she comes in vision that christ in, is yeah in a quick side note here yeah, a friend so... of mine brought this up another former adventist third generation brought this up to me the other day he said bro think about how crazy it is what they're saying she's the last human being to supposedly see the incarnate son of god mm. Unbelievable. <laughs> that, you know wow <laughs> Wow. Dude, she claims that she was taken and ushered right oh, into the most holy gosh. place multiple times. Right. She's right, given right. a tour, you know, in early writing, she's given a tour. Right. Jesus takes the mercy seat off. She gets to see the Ten Shows Commandments. Inside the, right. She sees the angels have like golden cart, like Wonka tickets to get in and out of heaven. Right. I've got Just a all sorts of stuff. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so terrible. she says she, she was taken off in vision to the most holy place where I saw Jesus still interceding for Israel. On the bottom of his garment was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. Levitical priesthood garb, folks. Right, exactly. Then I saw that Jesus would not leave the most holy place until every case was decided, either for salvation or destruction. She's getting into in explaining the early stages here of the investigative judgment. Yeah. Either for salvation or destruction. I saw that the wrath of God could not come until Jesus had finished his work in the most holy place, laid off his priestly attire, and clothed himself with the garments of vengeance. Close quote. Ellen G. White, Manuscript 2 of 1894, page 1. You can also see it in the book's uh, Present Truth, volume 1, uh, number 3, and page 22, as well as early writings, thirty, page 36. So she said these things frequently. This isn't just like a... Oftentimes, man, sometimes when they get in a corner, they like to say, oh, slip of the pen or like, you know, these crazy excuses. No, no, she was saying this stuff repeatedly. But then three months later to March of the same year, 1849, March 24, 1849, she claims that God showed her that there is a shut and open door. So you're starting to see how the present truth works now. Are you folks? It's it really should be um, convenient truth. That'd be a better definition for it. Convenient truth. It kind of just is like a malaise. It kind of just evolves and kind of just, well, we're just like kind of working it out as we go along. Yeah. She says, quote, <sighs> the Holy Ghost was poured out upon us and I was taken off in the spirit to the city of the living God again. Just chilling, you know, just whoop, taken to heaven. Is that the way Paul described whether it was him or somebody else? Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but I can't even speak of the things that I saw. Right. Is that the way they describe it? Like, oh, I was just chilling. You know, one of her visions, she's like chilling in the living room. And she's like, I was just there. And my uh, my accompanying angel, you know, just appears and just takes me off. And I'm just like up up to heaven. Right. It's like, fairy that. it's like a fairy no. tale. It's it's bad biblical fan fiction is what it is. It's yeah, terrible. 100%. <laughs> So she was taken to the, the city of the living God. There I was shown that the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, a very important phrase in Seventh-day Adventism, which is from Revelation, relating to the shut door, could not be separated. I'm going to read this again, folks. The Holy Ghost was poured out upon us, and I was taken off in the Spirit to the city of the living God. There I was shown that the commandments of God by that, they mean the Ten Commandments and the testimony of Jesus relating to the shut door could not be separated. And that the time for the commandments of God to shine out with all their importance and for God's people to be tried on the Sabbath truth was, then, uh, was when the door was opened in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary where the ark is containing the Ten Commandments. The door was not opened until the mediation of Jesus was finished in the holy place of the sanctuary in 1844. Then Jesus rose up and the shut door in the holy place. Oh, and, and he shut the door in the holy place and opened the door in the most holy and passed within the second veil where he now stands by the ark and where the faith of Israel now reaches. I saw that Jesus had shut the door in the holy place and no man can open it and that he had opened the door in the most holy, and no man can shut it. And since Jesus has opened the door in the most holy place, which contains the ark, the commandments have been shining out of God's pe to God's people, and they are being tested on the Sabbath question. 
I saw that the present test on the Sabbath could not come until the mediation of Jesus in the holy place was finished and he had passed within the second veil. Therefore, Christians who fell asleep before the door was opened in the most holy place when the midnight cry was finished, that phrase, the midnight cry again, at the seven month, seventh month in, the, in 1844 and had not kept the true Sabbath, they now rest in hope. For they had not the light and the test on the Sabbath, which we now have, since that door was opened. I saw that Satan was tempting some of God's people on this point because so many good Christians have fallen asleep in the triumphs of faith and have not kept the true Sabbath. They were doubting about it being a test for us now. I saw that the enemies of the present truth have been trying to open the door of the holy place that Jesus has shut and to close the door of the most holy place, which he opened in 1844, where the ark is containing the two tables of stone and on which are written the Ten Commandments by the finger of Jehovah. I saw that Satan was working through agents in a number of ways. Now get this, folks. If you watched the last two streams, I know I've mentioned that a lot, but we talked about a lot of this in passing in more granular detail, so you can go check those streams out to hear the more granular details about this, but you'll remember... There's this whole idea that she had about being shown that because Jesus left, those that didn't accept this continued praying and their prayers were going to the holy place. And Satan actually has assumed the throne that was there, being allowed essentially the ability to breathe upon people who pray, who rejected this message, meaning us, mm -hmm. to breathe upon them a deceiving spirit, making them think that they're praying to God. I saw that Satan was working through agents in a number of ways. He was at work through ministers who have rejected the truth, a.k.a. the 1844 message, and are given over to strong delusions to believe a lie that they might be damned. While they were preaching or praying, some would fall prostrate and helpless, not by the power of the Holy Ghost, no, no, but by the power of Satan breathed upon these agents and threw them to the people. Some professed Adventists who had rejected the present truth while preaching, praying, or in con uh, conversation used mesmerism to gain adherence. And the people would rejoice in this influence, for they thought it was the Holy Ghost. And even some that used it were so far in the darkness and deception of the devil that they thought it was the power of God given them to exercise. They had made God altogether such as one as themselves and had valued his power as a thing of not. She continues, I saw that Satan was at work in these ways to distract, deceive, and draw away God's people just now in the sealing time. I saw some who were not standing stiffly for present truth. Their knees were trembling and their feet were sliding because they were not firmly planted on the truth and the covering of Almighty God could not be drawn over them while they were thus trembling. I'm almost done. I know this is long. Satan was trying his every art to hold them where they were until the sealing, talking about the seventh day Sabbath being the seal of God here, was passed and the covering drawn over God's people and they left out without a shelter from the burning wrath of God in the seven last plagues. I saw that the mysterious signs and wonders and false reformations would increase and spread. The reformations that were shown me, again, this phrase shown me, mm -hmm. she's being shown all this supposedly right. from God, folks. The reformations that were shown me were not reformations from error to truth, but from bad to worse. <laughs> For those who professed a change of heart, meaning new converts, had only wrapped about them a religious garb which covered up the iniquity of a wicked heart. Some appeared to have been really converted, so it looked like they were actually genuine converts, so as to deceive God's people. Right. But if their hearts could be seen, they would appear as black as ever. Last par last section here. My accompanying angel bade me look for the travail of soul or of soul for sinners as used to be. I looked but could not see it, for the time of their salvation is past. Close quote. Mm -hmm. Ellen G. White, Present Truth, Volume 1, Number 3, August 1849, page 21 through 22. It is also in early writings, page 42 through 45. 
So very clearly, she's now pivoting on what the shut door is. So in the letter, it was at the time, remember the present truth at that time, the door of mercy shut. Mm -hmm. The excuse given is, well, the biblical prophets didn't understand a lot of times, you know, like they like to say Daniel, they love Daniel. Daniel didn't know the, the, the vision being shown to him, you know, immediately. Right. And so, you know, what Ellen said here is that God told her the door of mercy was shut. That wasn't the case. So they pivoted. That is not the same as what the prophet said. The prophet, Ellen didn't just say, well, God showed me something. And I don't know what it, what it means. Right. She says, God showed me this is what it means. Right. Then pivoted. That's very different. Correct. So she clearly is now pivoting on what the shut door is, saying that the door of the holy place is closed, but now the one of the most holy is open. And this is where they're going to, you'll see folks, this is where they're at now because right. they can't completely detach from this history. So they have to have some answer to, well, what about the shut door? Mm. Well, one door shut and another open. <laughs> So what was the point of the other one shutting? Right. It, 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 what did it, other than the change of the priesthood work, the next phase of heavenly atonement, how, why does it even matter then that the doors are shutting? Mm. You, you know, it's wild. Um, the more I think about it, um, the according to SDA uh, theology, right, um, or their, their worldview anyway, the, uh, the, the tabernacle on earth, was like a a direct copy of the one in heaven, correct? Oh boy, yeah. Okay, so um, if that's the case, how many doors were there in that tent? How many thrones were also in that tent? Okay, yeah. you know, and they're 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 it's in a, it's like a it's like a shotgun apartment. If you don't know what that is, it's one room and then the next section and the next section in front of each other. So if there's an another door. It's not a door that you open and close like a Western door that we would think in, in like I'm looking at my, my office right here. Yeah. It's not a door like that. So when they're talking about the doors open and doors closed, they really think it's a door. It's a curtain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the same thing <laughs> at <Jeez>. all. <laughs> <sighs> um, you know what? James. Oh, go ahead and answer that. Yeah. James. So here's the thing, James. Yeah. It depends who you talk to. Mm -hmm. because here's the reality i haven't talked to any um i i've talked to lots of their scholars i was educated colin was as well in their universities so mm -hmm. um like for example i know jed lake pretty well jed lake is an ellen white scholar in the sda church he wrote a book called uh ellen under fire defending essentially ellen and he's been also been working on a huge uh, I don't know if it's finished probably is by now because it's been a while, but he's working on another big book regarding Ellen. Um, it depends who you talk to because you get some that are very much uh, huffing the SDA church's own smoke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but you're also going to get some who behind closed doors when mm -hmm. the public spotlight is off, they're going to say, and you can ask EJ about this, right. unless people want to say EJ is just straight up lying, that's the only other alternative. Right. And e let me, ask let me... EJ, there are okay. people who behind closed doors will say, yeah, we know this stuff is kind of off. Just don't make any waves. Correct. And I don't say this much uh, for those who don't know, we're uh, referencing um, EJ Thunder Lorston. So shout out to him. Um, a matter of fact, um, Real quick, uh, shameless plug, you got it, brother. <laughs> All right, Hiding in Plain Sight, that's volume one there. Uh, the uh, 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 Answering Adventist Baths, um, there's three volumes, okay? Uh, please get them. They're available on Amazon and uh, um, uh, Barnes and Noble and all over the places, right? By the way, um, yes, because of you guys, I don't have much money, but you guys are going to make me go broke. There and you go. go. <laughs> and secondly, for you guys, if you're interested in textual critical issues mm -hmm. james snap i've had him on my channel he's been featured on many channels he's got his own youtube channel and a blog he is one of the most knowledgeable christian scholars on the text of the new testament and he is very well researched in the evidence supporting the authenticity of mark 16 9 to 20 and john 7 mm -hmm. 53 8 11 
Right. So he's not a King James only advocate. He doesn't even subscribe to the majority text position. He's a balanced authority who examines all the evidence and tries to deal honestly with the facts. So if you ever want him on your channel to talk about textual critical issues, he's balanced, he's fair, and he's a Excellent. blessing to the church. So just let you know, you guys know. Awesome. All right. Um, so yes. Uh, so shout out to James Knapp. All right. So, but yeah, get this, uh, get this book. There are three volumes. All right. So sure. it's called hiding in plain sight. Um, sorry about my glare here. Uh, let me get the idea. All right. There it is. All right. Hiding in plain sight. Um, I put the link um, in the chat and I think uh, brother Sam had put it up already. Uh, so please check that out. Um, there are three volumes. I had the honor and privilege of uh, writing the foreword for volume three, you know? Um, so yay. Uh, but uh, the point I'm making is with, um, uh, Anthony Advent has just brought up, you know, uh, on AC Theologian, check out Armchair Theologian, or you can look up AC Theologian on uh, on, uh, on the web here. And there is a literal, um, uh, an audio recording of people trying to bribe EJ Lorison. Yep. That's real facts. people, real time. Like, That's this facts. is real. Okay. So if you think that we're lying, right? If you think that we're making this stuff up, it, you you tell me what they said. Check it out. Okay. So armchair theologians, so shout out to you, brother. Yeah. Um, real quick, you can so go I'm and throw that out there. You can go on Google and put in AC Theologian. I think it's actheologian.com. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. So all right, yeah. But then notice too in this last quote, the other thing that's interesting. So, folks, this is the present truth for your day. So everyone here, I'm going to guess, because typically Sam's audience is classical Protestants. Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, the Syrian Church of the East, Coptics, etc. Mm -hmm. We are all united around the Lord's Day. But now, the present truth for this day, the pivot of this door of mercy now being shut, but actually another one opened. The reason it opened is to extend the period of probation, but also there's a new test for everyone here. And that's mm -hmm. the Seventh-day Sabbath. Yep. And that previous generations didn't have this. And it's the test that is the sealing period to see who truly is and isn't a Christian. And so the opportunity to be saved is still possible. But upon the acceptance of the supposed new light that God was now giving. So the new condition is you have to accept the unique SDA message for you. People like me and Colin there's no hope for us unless we were to go back to the Adventist church groveling on our hands and knees, basically begging for forgiveness, you know, <laughs> returning to the ark. We're out in the water drowning. So then she goes on. She then explicitly explains what she means by the last sentence in her book, Early Writings, page 45, which she actually mentions in that previous quote, the one about these supposed reformations where it was going to look like people were being converted, but they're not really being converted. It's a work of the devil to deceive because they rejected the 1844 message. Quote, this is from uh, Early Writings, page 45. The false reformations here referred to are yet to be more fully seen. The view relates more particularly particularly to those who are given over to strong delusions. Such will not have the travail of soul for sinners as formerly, having rejected the advent, meaning their message, mm -hmm. and being given over to the delusion of Satan. The time for their salvation is past. This does not, however, relate to those who have not heard and rejected the doctrine of the second advent. So now it's those who knowingly reject the supposed light from God those are the ones that are lost and there's no hope for them. So it went from the door being shut probations over the bridegroom has entered in and the doors closed. And they love to say, you don't have your oil anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, no oil for your lamp. It's too late. It's over the door shut. Well, then it pivots to, well, but another door's open now, which is extending probationary, the probationary period, but there's a new light that's coming with it that you have to adhere to. Right, And anyone who hears this new light, supposedly, and rejects it, well, now that you're the one that there's no hope for. But eh, God is probably going to be merciful to the people who 
haven't had this new light told to them yet. So this whole audience is now supposedly doomed right? because it's been revealed to you. So unless you now bow down to this idea that you have to adhere to uh, the Adventist church's tradition, which is what it is, they want to knock tradition very regularly uh, for the Adventists out there. You guys are slaves to a tradition. Um, the difference is, is that your tradition only goes back to the 19th century. Right. <laughs> so <clears throat> they have a tradition. And you have to bow down to this tradition if you want to truly be saved after having this presented to you. And this is the defense that the SDA church is now giving for this pivot, as I will now show you. We're going to read the updated footnote of the White Estate that they made on this in their updated 2010 PDF version of early writings in comparison to the original 1882 edition. Mm-hmm. So there was a change made to the footnote of the quote that I just read you in the updated 2010 PDF, which is what you'll get if you go to egwwritings.org and read early writings on there. You're going to get the most up-to-date one. You're not going to get the original one. This is a big kicker, folks, because it's this early writings original edition that not only was the footnote updated, they changed and took stuff out of the book that confirmed the shut door. You mean they tampered with the light from the throne? (gasps) Yeah, they did. They did. Um, And they're full of it. They know it. That's why this was, they tried to suppress this for so long. And 2023 is going to be a rough year for this movement. We are not going to stop. We are not going to be quiet. Jesus Christ is King. The true Mm -hmm. God is ruling and reigning. And seventh day Adventism, as a movement, not the people, not necessarily all the people. Colin and I loved the SDA bubble. We mm-hmm. loved that world, but we had to go wherever the truth led, and it was not Seventh-day Adventism. The yes. movement is an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's going to be made a footstool. Praise God. That's right. So in this updated, I'm going to read you first. This was the original edition's footnote in 1882. It said, about the quote that we just read earlier, quote, Objectors have claimed that this language teaches that the time for the salvation of all sinners was passed when this view was given. As a refutation of this claim, just one second, I got to zoom in on this actually. This is way too small. There we go. As a refutation of this claim, we ask the candid reader to look at a few facts. The scene of this vision was the false revivals of these days of which many specimens appeared shortly after the great Advent movement of 1844. In these revivals, she did not see the real travail of soul for sinners. Who would be expected to have travail for souls on such occasions? The ones, of course, who were carrying on these revivals. They did not have it. Why? They were false shepherds. They were given over to the strong delusions to believe a lie and to be lost. See preceding page, the time for their salvation was past. It is to the false shepherds, therefore, and not sinners in general to which this sentence applies. See also an explanation for this point from the pen of Sister White herself in Supplements to Experiences and Views on page 2. Bear in mind also that she never put the construction upon these words given them by the objector, but was at the same time constantly laboring herself for the salvation of sinners. So they were trying to make this pivot, essentially, in the footnote. That's the point of that, is that objectors have claimed that this language teaches that the time for the salvation of all sinners was passed when this view was given. But as a refutation, we want to present a few facts. And it's this pivot now that we're getting from these quotes uh, in... Uh, early writings, which is, you know, a few years after the supposed second vision and the, all this other nonsense that was taking place. Now, the new updated footnote, it's a little bit longer, but it reads, the writer of these words did not understand them as teaching that the time for the salvation of all sinners was past. At the very time when these things were written, she herself was laboring for the salvation of sinners, as she had been doing ever since. Bull crap. We're not getting into that tonight because we have so much to cover, but CMB, that is a load of oh, crap. Man. Yeah. 
She was not slaving. Hunted As you just saw in the letter, she was sad <laughs> that Sister Durbin had a heart for the lost. If you read Canwright's book, which SDAs, you guys have really got to get a better defense than just saying, Canwright was bitter. He was angry. The same thing you say about CMB and me and every other former Adventist. You've got to get over that. You have to deal with the facts that whether you like it or not, Canwright is a primary source documentation. The man lived with the whites for a number of years. You can say he's bitter, he's angry, he's whatever. Deal with what he was saying. You can read in his book a number of encounters and multiple books. You can read Life of Ellen G. White. You can read Seventh Adventism Renounced in all 42 of its editions. He gives multiple encounters of what it was like at the time. They were causing trouble wherever they went. They were telling people, they were shouting down the heathen. That was the term that was used for all the Christians of the day outside of them, the small little people of like less than 150 people. Right. And oh, by the way, um, uh, answering Adventism, what's um, what's uh, apostate Protestantism? Can you, can you tell us that real quick? Oh, right. Um, so <laughs> apostate Protestantism is what yeah. you and I are a part of and <laughs> any other Protestant in the audience. Um, right. <clears throat> idea of. So there's lots of Roman Catholics that are watching the stream here. Sorry, Eastern Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East. Um, you guys don't come into the discussion. Ellen White didn't have any understanding of the Eastern Church or the mm -hmm. Eastern world at all. The, the whole world, the whole scope of the world was Western. Um, not just that, but white people, too. We're not getting into the racism tonight, but you can look at a great stream that CMB did with uh, Phil Fox for an in-depth granular look at Ellen White's not only ignorance, but... Um, vast 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 racism mm. um but she had a very western mindset and the apostate protestants are the people who have essentially rejected the seventh day adventist message they are attached to the beast who is the roman catholic church and the vestige of uh attachment that the apostate protestants have to rome is the fact that they go to church on the papal sabbath which mm -hmm. is sunday <clears throat> So Roman Catholics, you're not the apostate Protestants. You're just the uh, pagan heathens um, that the apostate Protestants are attached to. So we're in good company, I guess. Right. <laughs> so it continues in this, yeah. this footnote. Her understanding of the matter as it had been presented to her is given in the following paragraphs, the first published in 1854 and the second in 1888. The false reformations here referenced are yet to be more fully seen. The view relates more particularly, particularly to those who had heard and rejected the light of the Advent doctrine. They are given over to strong delusions. Such will not have the travail of soul for sinners as formerly, having rejected the Advent and being given over to the delusion of Satan. The time for their salvation is past. This does not, however, relate to those who have not heard and rejected the doctrine of the second Advent. And by, and by second Advent, folks, they don't mean just believing that Jesus is returning. Everything in this movement has its own definitions. That's why it's hiding in plain sight, like EJ's books are titled. It uses all of this language that you're familiar with, but it doesn't mean the same thing. They mean the people that rejected their second Advent novel teaching. That's what is supposedly being rejected. Having rejected the advent and being given over to the delusions of Satan, the time for their salvation is past. This does not, however, relate to those who have not heard and rejected the doctrine of the second advent. It is a fearful thing to tread lightly the truth which has convinced our understanding and touched our hearts. I'm not going to read the rest of this because it's like super long, but the point being, they're now confirming this pivot. That's the point of all of this. The footnote is drastically different than it previously was because they're now trying to confirm this pivot that... As you're going to see here shortly, everything Ellen said was a correcting error. It was an establishing error. She never said the door of mercy was shut to everyone. It's only that the door of mercy has been shut to people who reject the new light that's been given. Remember, again, that's the pivot from this letter. So, the next quote. We're now in January 11, 1850. So we were back in March 1849. We're now in January 11, 
1850. And there's a lot more quotes between now and then. We shared that link earlier. You can see there's a ton of quotes, not just from Ellen White. You can follow the whole chronology of this thing to see how this was spreading like a parasite amongst these people. But in January 11, 1850, the door of salvation had shut, then swung open, then shut again. And now the door of salvation is conditional on accepting this message for those who have heard it, but those ignorant of it can still be saved in their innocence. So that's where we're at now in the timeline. She says, quote, oh, my brother and sister, I wish all of God's people could get a sight of it as God has shown it to me. So again, she's being shown all this, folks. Every one of these quotes we've read, it's I was shown, I was shown, I was shown, I was shown. This isn't just, oh, I was given a vision and here's what the symbol was. Here's what the symbols were, but I don't know what they mean. No, it's I was shown this and it confirms it means this. She right. liked to say a lot of times decidedly. This was right. decidedly <laughs> what I was shown. <laughs> for for a fact yeah you know that's the thing it's like you know um at least a little bit of humility would say i don't know what, the, what it was right yeah. um but when you have that kind of and you know like uh steve uh, dr steve daly was mentioned earlier so check out his book um it's called lng white a psychobiography um i think the link was put in earlier but uh yeah check that out and also um it's uh it's it, she she was very much a a, a deluded slash narcissistic person. Um, and Dr. Stephen Daly has a good way to uh, demonstrate that. He's also former Adventist pastor, and he is a clinical psychologist. So when you said this, narcissist? Correct, narcissist. Narcissistic personality disorder? That's right. I've never met any in my life. <laughs> never. <laughs> so, she can, so she continues in here. Right. Souls are coming into the truth, speaking of the investigative judgment and the shut door. And soon the work will be all done. Keep up good courage, hope in God, let nothing weigh thee down. We have the truth. We know it. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. I saw yesterday, again, another vision. I saw yesterday our work was not to the shepherds who have rejected the former messages, but to the honest deceived who are led astray. I saw the false shepherds would soon be fed with judgment. The apostate Protestants will soon be fed with judgment, CMV. Let the truth come out everywhere we go. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God. Cheer up. There are better days coming. Close quote. Ellen G. White, letter 18, 1850. Then in March 1850, so again, that was January 1850, now to March 1850, three months later, she's claiming God has yet again shown her this same thing. Anyone that's rejected the fanaticism of the shut door and Jesus going into the most holy place from the holy place in 1844, God has withdrawn himself from them. Quote, my dear brothers and sisters, this is a very important hour with us. Satan has come down with great power and we must drive hard and press our way to the kingdom. We have a mighty foe to contend with, but an almighty friend to protect and strengthen us in the conflict. If we are firmly fixed upon present truth. Remember, folks. It's fixed upon present truth. And CMB, you can attest to this. They believe that one day they're going to have to take a stand for the seventh day Sabbath, of which Ellen is saying is part of the present truth here. You're not going to have to die for Jesus and the gospel. Forget our brothers and sisters in the Middle East who are being martyred right now for the gospel and the Lord Jesus, the Eastern church that's been heavily persecuted. No, 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 no. The real persecution is going to come when they have to die, not for Jesus and the gospel, but for the seventh day Sabbath. Think about that. If we are firmly fixed upon the present truth and have our hope like an anchor of the soul cast within the second veil, it's not Jesus that's the anchor for the soul behind the, the second veil. It's this present truth. It's the seventh day Sabbath light that's been given to you by Ellen. So submit. The excitements and false reformations of this day do not, do not move us. She keeps mentioning false reformations. She's talking about false converts, people that it looks like the spirit of God is active in, but it's not really. It's Satan breathing an unholy influence on them. For we know that the master of the house rose up in 1844. That's why these are false reformations. And shut the door of the first apartment of the heavenly tabernacle. And now we certainly expect that they will go with their flocks to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He hath withdrawn himself within the second veil from them. The Lord has shown me that the power which is in them is a mere human influence and not the power of God. Close quote. 
Present Truth, Volume 1, Number 8, which was March 1850, page 64. Then we're in July 29, 1850. So we've moved from March 1850 now to July. This is now what she's saying. She then said it was shown to her that people must be baptized into the shut door theology along with the Seventh-day Sabbath, keeping the Ten Commandments and the faith of Jesus. One of their favorite buzz phrases, folks, which does not mean what it sounds like. It's not what you think it is. Is it CMB? Oh, he froze. Sorry, I'm, no, I'm, uh, I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 No, no, no. That's absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not what you think it is. It sounds all pious and great, but it's not what you think it's it terrible. is. It's terrible. It's <laughs> terrible. So she says, quote, said the angel. This is her accompanying angel who's telling her all sorts of things. Can ye stand in the battle in the day of the Lord? Ye need to be washed and live in newness of life. Then I saw that those whose hands are now engaged in making up the breach and are standing in the gaps that are formal that have formerly since 1844 broken the commandments of God and have so far followed the Pope as to keep the first day instead of the seventh, would have to go down into the water and be baptized in the faith of the shut door and keeping the commandments of God and in the faith of Jesus. So this is why in Adventism, folks, if you want to convert or you do convert from, say, being even a Baptist, not just a pagan Roman Catholic, if you convert from being a Baptist, you have to be rebaptized. Every person has to be rebaptized in this church. This is part of why. It's not one baptism. Mm, no, right. no, 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 no. That's not a valid right. baptism. It is one baptism, mm. but it's only a baptism in this church. <laughs> you have to be baptized into the shut door, which has now evolved into the 1844 Heavenly Sanctuary and Investigative Judgment Doctrines, as well as their teaching around the Ten Commandments and the faith of Jesus, which, again, we're not going to get into tonight, but it's not what it sounds like. I also saw that those who've been baptized as a door into the professed churches will have to be baptized out of that door again <laughs> and into the faith mentioned above. And all who have been baptized since 1844 will have to be baptized before Jesus comes. So everyone in the audience, you have to be rebaptized into the SDA church. <laughs> it's just insane. This is absolutely insane. So in 1844, everyone's baptism, it was a clean slate. Forget the fact. No, 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 no. Doesn't matter. Clean slate. Some will not gain progress now until the, that duty is done, and then they must live anew unto God and serve him faithfully. Close quote. Ellen G. White, Manuscript 16, 1850, page 2, July 20, 1850. Cool servant Jesus swag, what's their baptismal formula? It is what sounds like a Trinitarian baptismal formula, but personally, I renounced my Adventist baptism and received a valid Trinitarian baptism because they do not affirm the Trinity. While they may say Father, Son, and Spirit, they are tritheists. We covered this in my part one of the stream I did with Sam. EJ has content, EJ Lor uh, Thunder Lorston, as well as CMB. All of us have content on this, on our channels regarding this whole concept. I'm going to be doing a Trinity series and the Adventist Jesus series coming up. There'll be stuff on my channel. So personally, I renounced it because it is not a valid Trinitarian baptism. So now, fast forward to 18, August 1851. This is the white estate, folks, that link we, point, we, we posted earlier. This is on their own website in the same long-running thread of all this stuff. They admit this themselves. Fast forward to August 1851. So we've now moved from July 1850, a year and a month later, August 1851, and Ellen White published her first book, which contained her early visions, but she omitted the stuff pertaining to God rejecting the wicked world, a.k.a. those who rejected their fanaticism and her false visions. So you can type that in on there. Just type in August 1851, and it will take you to the note that they themselves put in there saying it was then omitted in the later version of early writings. That was what I was telling you about. It's like 39 words or something like that, that they omit from the early one where she did say that the door was shut to the wicked world, which didn't include, by the way, just the former Adventists that walked away and rejected the fanaticism. That's not what it initially was. That was the pivot to where they're essentially at now. But yet again, in true Ellen White fashion, she claims on August 24, 1874, so now we're jumping 
ahead by like almost 20 years, that she maintains the integrity of all of her visions and that she never claimed to be shown in vision that no more sinners could be converted. Completely contradicting herself. So this was the whole pinnacle that we were leading to, folks. This is why I said earlier, pay attention during the letter to what she was saying. Because now they're claiming, and Ellen herself claimed, which because she said it later on, then the Adventist church and the white estate, of course, say, well, she clearly says that she never said that the, the door of mercy was shut completely to the lost. She says, quote, With my brethren and sisters, after the time passed in 1844, I did believe no more sinners could be converted. But I never had a vision that no more sinners would be converted. (laughs) And I'm clear and free to state, no one has ever heard me say or has read from my pen statements, which will justify them in their charges they have made against me upon this point. I never have stated or written that the world was doomed or damned. I never have under any circumstances used this language to anyone, however sinful. I've never had messages of reproof for those who used these harsh expressions. Close quote. Letter two from 1874, selected messages, book one, page 74. So this is a lie. As you heard in the letter uh, letter earlier, she claimed that her second vision in February 1845 revealed that the world was lost and no one else could be saved. She then flip-flopped on this. Uh, over time as present truth supposedly changed, saying that there are two doors, and while one was shut, another opened, allowing the probationary period of man to be extended, but tested by the seventh-day Sabbath, adherence to the investigative judgment, the keeping of the Ten Commandments perfectly, and the faith of Jesus. So the conclusion and where the SDA Church stands today. The term shut door, at first, was used to indicate the close of probation in 1844. But then it shifted to mean the close of Christ's ministry in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary. It's now viewed to represent a change in Christ's ministry in heaven on October 22nd, 1844, i.e. the beginning of the investigative judgment. The excuse given for this is that Ellen didn't understand that she was being shown, just like the Old Testament prophets didn't know exactly, and so her comments on them were off because of that. The claim is they were right all along, just not that the new door had opened while the first one shut, using Matthew 22 and the parable of the bridegroom as the primary support. They will also say that the apostles had a shut door. This is what I was talking about earlier, about they love to do these little parallels. Like, well, the Old Testament prophets didn't know, so therefore Ellen. They say that the apostles had a shut door. They believed that uh, the Gentiles couldn't be saved. The door of of salvation was only open to the Jews, but they were wrong. So therefore, that proves Ellen is no different than them. Except the problem, folks, as I'm sure this audience is aware because people here have an IQ over room temperature. Nowhere did the apostles, and typically it's Peter who they mention, ever say, God showed me salvation for Gentiles is not possible. Peter never spoke falsely on behalf of God. None of the prophets or apostles did. So remember earlier in their book, they said, if they contradict scripture or the law, by the law, they mean the Ten Commandments. Why did I mention the second commandment earlier, the first and second commandment earlier, which are intrinsically tied? Adventists, you need to stop saying, by the way, that Roman Catholics have removed uh, some of the commandments uh, and then point to their catechism because all that happened is they conjoined uh, the first and second commandment together because they're intrinsically tied uh, regarding idolatry. So the first and second commandment have to do one of the many aspects is speaking falsely on behalf of God. Folks, this woman spoke falsely on behalf of God, as you just saw. I don't care what the Adventist church says. They can give all the excuses they want and come up with all these word games and semantics and all this stuff. At the end of the day, she doesn't even pass just on this alone. CMB is now about to get into a bunch more stuff than just this. This wasn't the only prophecy this woman gave. She claimed to have 2,000 visions. So with that said, she does not pass just off of that. By their own standard, from their own exposition, Contradicts scripture, which they said she ha- they, they have to align with the, the previous revelation of scripture. Contradicts it. 
And on top of that, she broke the law. She claimed to speak on behalf of God falsely. CMB, that's all I got. The floor is yours. All right, man. Uh, listen, uh, excellent uh, expositions as well. I'm glad you always uh, are able to come and bring the facts. You know what I mean? So, and here's the thing. Uh, many, 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 many times um, when we were former SDAs or people who are uh, not former SDAs, but anyone that's coming against uh, what Ellen uh, may have said or the church's position, oftentimes the accusation is, hey, that's out of context. You know, uh, answering Adventism has spent almost an hour and 25 minutes in context, and it's still trash. So, you know, uh, knock yourself out, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> if you, that's your defense, it's a bad one. But anyway, so here we go. I digress. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen in just a moment. Um, and we're going to be looking at uh, just uh, taking a closer look at the prophetic uh, claims of the SDA church. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And let me know if you can share my screen. Uh, there we go. Thank you, sir. All right. When I'm in full screen, let me know if you can see what you can see. All right. You see everything? Yes, sir. All right, beautiful. Okay. So a uh, closer look at the prophetic claims of the SDA church. Now, um, as uh, answering Adventism has just demonstrated for us, prophecy can in, uh, include both foretelling and foretelling. So foretelling would be speaking or proclamation um, and foretelling would be like, i.e. future events, right? So we talked about both and how both have been violated uh, by Ellen White. So, um, and the problem is that she's always saying that she's speaking for God. Um, you know, if you're at, uh, there's a quote there. I don't have it right in front of me. I do have it on another uh, passage uh, or in another presentation where uh, she says that if you feel like you're at variance with Ellen White, uh, you're not at variance with Sister Wright. You're at variance with the Lord, right? Um, so that's a problem. But again, uh, fundamental belief number 18, we have seen that in ad nauseum. They say that her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. Uh, so the church, not our church, the church. It also makes clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Now, the problem is that she is the one who's able to correct bad doctrine, according to them. So you can't just go to the Bible. You have to go to the Bible and then go to the uh, to Ellen White's interpretations of Scripture. That's how that works. So it is circular reasoning. It's bad argumentation. And it's what I like to call uh, the, uh, theological um, uh, house of uh, th theological three car marty is the word. Uh, so um, it's it's a it's a, a sleight of hand is what it is. OK. Um, and as you can see right there, Adventist.org. I try to um, put all of the receipts in neon green so you can see them at the bottom of the screen there. OK. Um, and again, so shout out to Alias, who is in the chat there, said that she never claimed to be an, a, pro a prophet. Um, well, the church says she speaks with prophetic authority. So I don't know how many prophets or non-prophets, you know, that speak with prophetic authority, but that's all we're seeing. And that's all the church acknowledges. So take with that what you will. Anywho, so biblical testament prophets, this is found on E.G. White writings, or I'm sorry, the LNG White estate, um, LNG White estate. And you can see the, um, the website there, ellenwhite.org. Okay. FAQ number 18 okay so uh this is what they say um this is a direct quote from the site the bible tells us not to despise prophecies um but also admonishes us to be aware of false prophets uh how can we tell a true prophet from a false one fortunately the bible provides us with tests of a prophet it is essential that all tests be applied to anyone who claims to possess the gift of prophecy Seventh-day Adventists believe that Ellen White fulfills each one of the following four tests. Okay, One, they must confess and uplift Jesus. Um, two, they must harmonize with Scripture. So it's slightly different wording from what uh, uh, Adventist Adventism had brought up earlier, but it's the same thing. Uh, three, yields good fruit. And four, prophecies must come to pass. All right, so here we go. Um, must confess and lift up Jesus. So um, Ellen White wrote extensively on Jesus and devoted entire books, such as The Desire of Ages, as well as thousands of other pages uh, to him. Here are two of the quotations rep representative of many more. Um, I think I have both. Uh, I can't remember what I was kind of editing later. So um, look, oh, Jesus, look, oh, look to Jesus and live. Fundamentals of Christian education. That's a good one. Right. Um, here it is. Lift up Jesus that you might teach the people. Lift him up in sermon, in song, in prayer. 
Let all your powers be directed to pointing souls, confused, bewildered, lost to the Lamb of God. Lift him up, the risen Savior, and say to all who hear, um, come to him who hath loved us and hath given himself for us. Let the science of salvation be the burden of every sermon, the theme of every song. Gospel Worker, Workers, page 160. Sounds great, okay? Um, but <laughs> does Ellen White always confess and lift up Jesus? Hardly. <laughs> so, this is it from the story of redemption. Um, my, uh, Entering Adventism has said it um, on multiple occasions. I think we read it um, online before. Um, and from the... Um, um, spiritual gifts. So this is a kind of the same idea. Um, they do kind of remix a lot of her writings anyway. So this will sound familiar uh, to the spiritual gifts quote, but this is from this specific book. Um, I read it over a summer um, when I was back in college, back in the 90s. Anyway, here it says the fall of Lucifer, and this is uh, screenshots from my PDF copy. So uh, Lucifer in heaven before his rebellion, rebellion uh, was high and exalted angel. Next, in honor to God's dear son. Pay attention to the wording, guys. All right. His countenance, like those of the other angels, was mild and expressive of happiness. His forehead was high and broad. Okay. Um, that's also part and parcel of, um, what's that stuff with the, the brain, uh, I mean, the uh, um, head shape and stuff like that? Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Um, it slips my mind. Anyway. Um, so his... Yeah, you know, they're talking about head shape would determine whether you're a moral person or um, any yeah, of that stuff. Sorry, it's cranium, but it's all right. I'm I'm dumb, so forgive no, me for that. Uh, there was a um, there was a, a, a pseudoscience for that. Anyway, I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, regardless, uh, his head was bright, high and broad, um, showing a powerful intellect. His form was perfect. His bearing noble and majestic. A special light beamed in his countenance and shone around him, brighter and more beautiful than the other angels. Yet Christ. God's dear son had the preeminence over all the angelic host. He was one with the father before. Um, yes, that's one of the words. Um, uh, phren phrenology. That's the word I'm thinking of. Phrenology, right? Yes, that's it. Yes, that's it. That's it. Phrenology. Um, so she said she, um, sidebar, she said she didn't agree with that, but then she brings it up uh, often or a couple times in the writings. Anyway, um, yet Christ, dear own son, had the preeminence over all the angelic hosts. He was one with the father before the angels were created. Lucifer um, was uh, envious of Christ and gradually assumed, oops, sorry, uh, command, uh, which devolved on uh, Christ alone. Okay. All right. So the great creator assembled the heavenly host. This is the same quote here uh, that he might in uh, the presence of all the angels confer special honor upon his son. The son was created on the throne with the father and heavenly throng of holy angels uh, was gathered around them. The father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his son, should be equal with himself. Are you all hearing what's being written here? So that whenever the presence of his son, as it, uh, so, so that whenever was the presence of his son, it was as his own presence. Now, I got to ask y'all, if Christ uh, has created all things that are seen and unseen, right? All things visible and invisible. Why would the angels need to be told to worship him? Why would why would why would angelic beings be told that they need to honor him as they honor God? If if they it's they believe in the Trinity, right? <laughs> why would this need to be explained to yeah, them? Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> it just okay. does not jive with Orthodox Trinitarianism. Like it does it's not, not possible. Okay. Right. You, you got you got you got to make it make sense for me. OK, uh, the word of the son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the father. OK, his son had invested with authority to command the heavenly host, especially was his son in work with you. Uh, uh, sorry, was his son to work in union with himself in the anticipated creation of the uh, earth and every living thing that should exist upon the earth. His son would carry out his will and his purposes, but would do nothing of himself alone. The father would be fulfilled in him. Lucifer was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. Again, how can a created being be jealous of a creator? How? How? Like, well, not just that, brother, but the f real quickly. Yeah. The fact that she says it was invested in him. Mm -hmm. Yes. That that means he didn't have it. <laughs> they, they try to make these crazy arguments, man. Like, oh, the exaltation. It was just the father mm. revealing something that's always been the case. Right. That's the argument that I've heard on this. 
Mm. Man, it's just like, no, over and over. He was invested with something he didn't previously possess, and that's what caused this mm -hmm. jealousy. All right. This and, is and the he, fountainhead of their worldview, by the way, folks. Facts, yeah. Um, and look, look at this part here, guys. Um, it says, when, yet when all the angels bowed to Jesus to acknowledge his supremacy and high authority um, and rightful rule, he bowed with them, but his heart was filled with envy and hatred. Check it. Christ had been taken into the special council of God and uh, regard to all his plans while Lucifer was unacquainted with them. Does that sound like it's Trinitarian to you? Like, just think, just no. think about it. Christ, separate from God, is taken into the special council of God. And where's the Holy Spirit in all this? Oh, right. No, this is during the up. phase where the movement thought the Holy Spirit right. was just like a force that proceeded from the Father and the Son. Right. Not, not anywhere around at this point. Okay. Oh, man. Okay. He did not understand. Real Neither quick, was... CMB. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I don't think you said this earlier, but just to make sure people know. Yeah. Folks, she claimed to be shown all this. Correct. This isn't just like writing down. No, no. She claimed to be shown all this. So this is prophetic work here. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, sounds like JW theology. And listen, JWs, Mormons, and Seventh-day Adventists are all kissing cousins. Okay. Literally and theologically. What I mean by that is uh, Joseph Smith, one of his wives, was Ellen White's cousin. She stole her uh, the narrow path vision from First Nephi chapter eight, and they all came from the same area in upstate New York. They're all, all over each other and on top of each other. What even is the special council? Who else is there? Uh, depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> Right, uh, he did not understand neither. I'm going to keep on rolling. Was he permitted to know the purposes of God? But Christ was acknowledged sovereign of heaven, his power and authority um, to be the same as that of God himself. Okay, wicked cousins, exactly right. Okay, so this is stuff that you can't make sense of if you're going to hold to a Trinitarian position, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. All right, so SDA Jesus is introduced to the uh, angels and authority is given to him and worship of him is required by God, okay? Implication, Jesus is not the creator of all things, made visible and invisible, and as God, isn't inherently and ontologically worthy of worship. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right, so uh, that's a problem. So um <laughs> Jesus, SDA Jesus, right, is exalted above Lucifer, okay, causing him to become jealous of Jesus as included in the plan, uh, inclusion in the plan to create the earth. The implication here is that Lucifer, although a created being, is essentially equal to Jesus and could have participated in creation. How do we know this? Because he is uh, the scapegoat and he is equally uh, able to bear the sins and he does at the end of their eschaton. So there you go. <laughs> right. This is facts. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, sadly, and, sadly. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, and guys, uh, if I think you talked about it before, but um, it's called the burned over district. The burned over district. Um, it gets talked about in some um, uh, uh, writings and uh, historical writings about the religious movements of that area. Um, there's a book called um, Occult America, um, by I think the guy's last name is Horowitz. I want to say. Uh, Mitch, Mitch Horowitz, I want to say, uh, is the last name. Um, but yeah, he writes that and he uh, touches briefly on the Burned Over District, um, as does uh, this book here, um, uh, Ellen Harmon White, right? An American prophet. Okay. Good book here as well, too. Um, some of the writers are, um, it's a compilation of uh, essays, you know, um, and so different aspects of our life. And some of the writers are SDA and some of them are not. Um, so you get a, a good balance of um, what, you know, pro SDA would look like in, uh, in <laughs> regular historians <laughs> would look like, if you will, for lack of a better term. All right. So uh, let's continue. <laughs> uh, the Jesus Ellen White acknowledges is neither the God man described in the scriptures and his deity, specifically his trying nature, is nowhere to be found in this passage of literature, which is unique to her. So that's kind of the point that we're getting at. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I dare someone to try and tell me different based on this. <laughs> so, does Ellen White confess and lift up Jesus here, Miles? 
I'd say no. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> Next, number two. A different Jesus, an idol, which I don't, which again, ironically, their um, infatuation with the Ten Commandments and the irony right. of their idolatry. Um, mm. Adventists, the Adventist Church has a false Christ. That's an idol. Mm. Exactly. Idols are not only statues of stone and wood. Mm-hmm. It's false Christ as well. And the SDA Church has a false Christ. By the way, this test the prophet I checked his YouTube channel. It seems like this person is also exposing LNG White. Do you know this person? Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We talked earlier today. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. If you guys didn't want to come back and bring him on, my channel is open to you guys. So just let you Big facts. Yeah. Test uh, the prophet. Email me and let's set that up. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Good brother right there. Good brother right there. All right. So must harmonize with scripture. Number two. Um, Ellen White um, wrote more than 100,000 pages. This is their quote from the same page, um, which provide us not only with an abundance of material for applying this test, but also with the difficulty of having to study an incredibly large body of text to make a thorough assessment. Wait a minute. Hold on. The test is that you must harmonize with scripture. So how in the I'm not going to cuss on your show, but how in the world are you going to sit here and say that we have an abundance of things to look at, but we can't tell because there's too much to look at? Does that make sense? Like, at all? Bro, she wrote more, 10 times more than the Bible. 10 times, right? And the church is continuously putting out um, compilations and they're yeah. remixing the compilations. I tell people all the time, and, I, and I'm, y'all forgive me, I'm a hip hop head from back in the 90s, but she has more posthumous hits than Tupac, Biggie, and Elvis combined. It's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> it's so it's, it's so unbelievable. Dude, okay? she, they're at a hundred. The last I saw, they were at 150. Compilations. compilations compilations right not original m- manuscripts even Mm-mm. compilations it's same crap different shovel and you're yes. gonna be shelling out money for it every single time you know yep. so yeah this is <laughs> it's a <laughs> money-making machine that's what it's yep. always about it was always mm-hmm. a, she was a money-making machine mm-hmm. right and you can't get enough of it, you know? No. So here we go. Must harmonize with scripture. This personal responsibility is beyond the scope of this summary, but we would encourage readers to apply this test for themselves as they read. So as you read, dear reader, 100,000 pages plus, <laughs> and the hits keep on coming. <laughs> also find time to study your Bibles as well, too. So, you know, knock yourself out. But don't forget the testimonies. So, yeah. Hebrews. <laughs> Chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2a says this. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times in a different way. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. That's the A clause in verse 2. Let's look at what Ellen says. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies, answering Adventism and any other former. What are the testimonies? Ellen White's writings. Oh, there you go. (laughs) So in these days, he speaks to them by his testimony. So you're not speaking through Christ. You're speaking through the testimonies. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them pursue. David, Moses, Abraham. Second no, court. no, no. B team. Does it no. can't hold a candle to Ellen White? Bench warmers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's never a time before she rolled up on the scene. 1876. Yeah. Pre- present God, truth. She came around. Oh, Pre- present so truth. Better. Feels so much better than she came around. Oh my gosh. Anywho. So, okay. EGW, to obey the commands of God, it, the commandments of God, and of course, I mean the 10, is the only way to obtain his favor. Testimonies, volume four. Page 28. Galatians chapter 3 says, Now it's clear that no one is justified before God by the law because the just will live by what? Faith. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Now without faith, it's impossible to please God, for the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. So if you were to believe in Ellen White, the commandments of God is the only way to obtain his favor. The Sabbath is the golden clasp that, uh, you know, binds uh, God and his people. Like, it's, she will say anything. 
and it there's does a not halo uh, there's a halo of light around the fourth commandment when the she was given her tour of heaven and shown the commandments inside the ark of the covenant there's a, a bright halo shining around the fourth commandment right and all the angels are looking at the law <laughs> It's like, even depicted it's, in their art. Folks, yeah. just go on Google and type in Seventh-day Adventist art. I guarantee you within like three pictures, there will be one that has something depicting the Ten Commandments. <sighs> it will be a person standing in front of them with Jesus, like the westernized Jesus with right. his arm around the person. 20 commandments, buddy. <laughs> Matter of fact, I have uh, in another presentation, I can actually pull up <laughs> some of the art stuff if you want, but I don't have a stomach cut. But uh, <laughs> it's all bad, bro. It's all bad. All right. So do Ellen White's writings harmonize with scripture all the time? No, of course not. All right. So let's move on to the next thing. Um, <laughs> yes, that's facts. That's facts, Chai. That's facts. All right. Um, the local newspaper of the California town. This is a quote still from uh, the LNG White the state, guys. Um, the local newspaper of the California town, St. Helena, wrote shortly after her death, quote, the life of Mrs. White is an example worthy of emulation by all. She was a humble, devout disciple of Christ and ever went about doing good. She was revered by all the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and honored and respected by all who appreciate normal, noble womanhood consecrated to the unselfish labor for the uplifting and betterment of mankind. Influence of her life and messages, the same newspaper contained a resume of denominational accomplishments. In membership, um, nearly 100,000, 37 publishing houses, uh, what's that, 34 sanitariums, 70 uh, intermediate schools, academies, and colleges, and 510 elementary schools scattered all over the world. Mrs. White's work, Mrs. White's work, say that five times fast, as an author was mentioned, noting that some of her writings had been translated into 36 languages. The, and even now, it's even more languages. Like, you know, so that they're literally a worldwide organization. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> fruit. Okay. So we got to know about the fruit. Okay. Um, this is the Office for Regional Conference Ministries. Miles, can you tell us what a regional conference is? Um, it's like a pretty, it's like a high level in their church's hierarchical structure. Um, so it's, do you want me to like go through all the levels? No, no. So, um, so we have divisions in the church, right? Um, we, yep. so we sometimes still, so forgive me. Um, but yeah, so you have the general conference, right? You have the divisions. Okay. So you have North American division, South American division, and yada, 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 inner America. I would say cover the Caribbean and so forth. Um, different regions in Africa, right? Um, regional conferences in the United States of America, specifically in the United States of America are what we consider the quote unquote black conferences. Yeah. Okay. If you don't know, and you want to know, Shameless plug, check out the BK Apologist channel, the Ew. BK Apologist channel, and we have a video there called The Hidden Race Doctrine of the SDA, and we blow it up, all right? And so we talk about some of the hidden racism that's in there, and we talked about this um, also in terms of Revelation 13, which is a linchpin passage and how there's racism embedded in that. Um, uh, which we did with uh, Phil Fox also on the BK Apologist channel. So check that out. And All this right? isn't folks. And this isn't like a 21st century modern culture defined. No, this is full on true yeah. racism, true, yeah, full on yeah. 100%. He's not just using a buzzword right now. I'm just trying yeah. to make that this, known. Right. This yeah. is so legit I, racism that some <laughs> races of people are an amalgamation of man and beast. Subhuman, if you will, you know, it's, yeah. and it's all over the place, you know. And, and when so, everyone gets to heaven, they'll be made as nice. white as Jesus is. <laughs> That's a direct quote from Ellen White, by the way. So, yeah, FYI. So, if you didn't know Jesus was white, you'll be white when you get to heaven. Whether or not you're a part of every nation, tribe, and tongue, and kindred yeah. people, we all gonna be white. So that's all good. All right. So, um, that's kind of what that is there. So, the regional conferences are a result of Ellen White's nonsense. Okay. Um, fruit. Uh, this is uh, a, a monument outside of Waco, Texas. Does anyone know what happened in Waco, Texas in the 90s? 
Ask your David grandparents. <laughs> David Koresh, cult leader at the Branch Davidian Complex. Complex. Now, if you don't know, the um, the FBI raided them, um, and it was a fiery inferno is madness. Um, as you can see in the large um, print here, the uh, it says the shep seven shepherds of the Advent movements. This is her legacy. Okay. Now, if you look a little closer, right? I'll zoom in for you. You're welcome. Uh, what we have here on the left is Ellen G. White. Okay, she's the first shepherd, and the uh, second shepherd. Uh, I was sorry, the one down the line is Vernon Wayne Howell, and I put February twenty third, twenty twenty three. Yeah, I think it's nineteen ninety three is what it was. I was doing this late last night. But <laughs> this fiery inferno that you see uh, right here was um, a picture of what the compound looked like after the FBI raided it, and some uh, some barrels were caught on fire. Um, if you were around in Seventh Day Adventist circles at that time, there was a massive PR campaign to say, oh, those aren't Seventh Day Adventists. They're not. However, Vernon Howell, a.k.a. David Koresh, was a Seventh Day Adventist, was kicked out of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and went and joined with the Branch Davidians, which is an offshoot of the Seventh Day Adventist Church. They just happened to take Ellen White's writings that seriously. Okay. Said Indeed. she was one of his idols. Exactly. Right. And she, he's right in the line with all this other nonsense there. So one cult begets another cult. That's how that works. All right. So this was um, not 2023. I think it was 1993. I missed that. So good fruit, guys. Uh, they say in a vacuum ain't good enough. <laughs> it's also about not bearing bad fruit. Okay. So um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Remember, the argument was like how many good things you do, like how many uh, disaster relief organizations that you have, how many things, uh, hospitals and sanitariums. That's not the point. OK, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not we prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and in your name, perform miracles. And I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Which away from you, evildoers. Like, frightening. Sobering. All right. Um, uh, EGW's legacy built, founding on bearing good fruit. No. Okay. Four. Prophecies must come to pass. 1861, shortly before the American Civil War, conventional wisdom taught that there would be no war because the South wouldn't be so stupid as to start one, or that it would be over quickly if it ended, if, the, if indeed there were a war. Okay, Ellen White received two visions indicating, among other things, that there would indeed be a long and protracted war with great carnage, prisoner of war camps, unspeakable squalor, filth, and disease. She even said that some parents in the congregation she spoke to would lose sons in the war. Two years later, Ellen White was proven right. Well, there you go. So prophecies must have come to pass, right? Um, well, but wait, uh, there's more. This is what she said. <laughs> Quote, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, there you go, sweet one. Yeah, exactly right. So they try to, you know, back off on everything that they said before. Um, Sunday we worship is in the mark of the beast. Y'all remember when um uh, uh Ben Carson ran for president a couple years ago? He's a SDA, right? And they try to back off on that, but hey, we know what it is. America and prophecy. That is another title for the great controversy. All right. Um, it's the same thing. It is that's what they teach, period. All right. Um, again, slavery will be again revived in the southern states. For, forgive me. Did that happen? I uh, can't recall. No. Okay, good. All right. So slavery will be revived in the southern states, for the spirit of slavery still lives. Therefore, it will not do for those who labor among the colored people to preach the truth as boldly and as openly as they would be free to do in other places. Even Christ clothed his lessons in figures and parables to avoid the opposition of the Pharisees. So one, you have an issue with Ellen saying that slavery will be again revived in the southern states, specifically in the southern states. And what I've had people tell me was that oh no the, the slavery worldwide i'm like this says the southern states right pretty clear right we want to make sure it's in context don't we you know so. <laughs> yeah like there's slavery elsewhere in the world okay right. she said the southern states referring right. to the united states facts right all right moving on so uh same quote here when the colored people feel they have the word of god in regard to the sabbath question not jesus 
they don't need the gospel. Right? <laughs> they need to know about the Sabbath. That's the deal, right? In regard the third to the Sabbath angel's place, messages, the facts. third angel's message. Got to have that. And the sanction of those who have brought them the truth. Okay. That's them. Some who are, imp- listen, y'all, some who are impulsive will take the opportunity to defy the Sunday laws and by a presumptuous defiance of their oppressors will bring to themselves much sorrow. Very faithfully, the colored people must be instructed to be like Christ, to patiently suffer wrongs that they may help their fellow men see the light of truth. So when Sunday or the slavery comes back in the Southern States and you have received the truth of the Sabbath, Make sure you be a good little slave so the the masters can see how good you are so you can be just like Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That's a word from on high if I ever heard one. You know, unbelievable. Again, folks, I just want to remind people that the topic tonight was false prophecies, which includes speaking on behalf of God, forth telling, etc. All of the stuff that we're reading tonight. It's stuff she claimed to be shown. This is all from God. Oh, boy. Like, you, you can't make this stuff up. Like, I mean, well, she did, but, you know, um, this is, <laughs> this is, this is unbelievable. And people want to sit up here and try and tell us that we don't know what we're talking about. Like, we really have read this stuff. Like, we really still read this stuff so we can talk to people. Yeah. I'm not like when when the Adventists try and comment on my channel, it's like, guys, you've been out for many decades. I've been out for about 10 years now. Mm -hmm. Folks, I've been engaging with y'all. I went to an SDA university to specifically do that. Mm -hmm. I've debated your professors, your pastors publicly, privately. I've had discussions with hundreds of Seventh day Adventists. You don't think I've heard this line and seen the same apologetic from you guys? You're going to have to get over that at some point and deal with the facts. We're reading large swaths of text here, folks. We're mm-hmm. not taking stuff out of context. That can't just be your escape hatch all the time. Right. We've read these books, and we weren't reading them just quote mining. I was reading this because I wanted to defend Seventh Adventism. And then in trying to do that, it's like, holy crap, this isn't even possible if you actually read the Bible without this great controversy theme. Right. Oh, my goodness. We, I, I don't know how much you want to get into that either, but... Boy, you guys, way too many receipts to deny all the evidence. That's right. That's my line. You know, receipts longer than CVS. So, so, so <laughs> real deal. All right. Okay. Speaking of the war again. Okay. England is studying whether it is best to take advantage of the present weak condition of our nation. Oh, God. And venture to make war upon her. She is weighing the matter and trying to sound uh, other nations. She fears if she should commence war abroad, that she would be made weak at home and that other nations would take advantage of her weakness. Other nations are making quiet yet active preparations for war and are hoping that England will make war with our nation. For then they would improve the opportunity to uh, be revenged on her for the advantage she has taken of them in the past and the injustice done them. The quote continues. A portion of the queen's subjects are awaiting a favorable opportunity to break their yoke. But if England thinks that it will pay, she will not hesitate a moment to improve her opportunities to exercise her power and humble our nation. This is about the Civil War, y'all. When England does declare war, all nations will have an interest in their of their own to serve, and there will be general war, general confusion testimonies of volume one yada 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 so if you will can you remind us again in american history when england declared declared war during the civil war cmb it was part of that uh the adventist favorite phantom history right you remember yeah no <laughs> <laughs> can't recall <laughs> their, their defense to this is it was a conditional prophecy Right. So you'll find that's their other escape hatch they try to use all the time, folks, is when they run out of everything else, mm-hmm. the last method of defense is, oh, no, it was a conditional prophecy. It was ba- it was only on mm-hmm. certain conditions uh, being met. 
That's facts. Uh, and check out Test Profits um, quote here, guys. Um, and, and you know who does a good job? And again, we talked about uh, Dr. Steve Daly's book, um, Ellen G. White, A Psychobiography. Go get it on Amazon. Um, it, it she did. Uh, and again, it was it was it's like news is newspaper worthy, right? So people were like speculating who is England going to jump in? What's going to happen? Spanish American War was coming up, or, or around that time as well too. So there's a lot going on, you know, worldwide. So even though it took a lot longer for people to get from point A to point B than they do now, right? It was still a thing. Right. Yep. So people were, you know, were, were talking about this. So it wasn't some uh, some some nonsense here uh, that people are just making up. No, no. They thought that it could have been a real possibility that England could invade. Then she says that God showed her when England does declare war, all nations will have an English uh, 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 interest to serve their own. Right. It's nonsense. It is absolute nonsense. And she tried it and she failed. OK. So the guy that commented. Rob D81, he says, to be frank, as an Englishman, my country thought about intervening in the Civil War, but we didn't. We did secretly make ships for South. Mm -hmm. No one's denying that. Right. She's saying that God showed her that England would declare war right. in this, and it didn't happen. So it's a happen. false prophecy. Facts. Yeah. And like I said, and you can, you can, and again, these are just easy, low hanging fruit examples. We can go through this. And again, this is the biggest one the yeah. National Sunday Law, right? Yep. Yeah. This is the Cliff's Notes version of the uh, the Great Controversy, okay? So if you ever get this book, right, it's going to tell you all kinds of stuff that the Great Controversy says, okay? Yeah. That there will be a National Sunday Law, in which will have international Sunday claims in the United States of America. Sorry, Sam. Will be in cahoots with, <laughs> with the Roman Catholic Church and the, the Pope, and they will declare a Sunday to be sacred. Um, and then when that happens is, uh, you know, you're going to have, uh, that's when the dividing line will happen between whether you're going to keep the Sabbath um, with them or it's Sunday. Yep. And it's going to be a threefold union. So this is where apostate Protestantism comes back into play. Mm -hmm. There's supposedly going to be a threefold union between apostate Protestantism, audience, get this, mm -hmm. and Roman Catholicism, as well as pagan spiritualism. spiritualism. Right. <laughs> We're all going to link arms. So the mm -hmm. Reformation, the divide of the Reformation, is just going to be miraculously gapped, or, or, or the gap's going to be filled because, well, we all go to church on the same day. Right. And that is then going to link up with pagan spiritualism, which what they mean by that is, the general malaise of like worldviews that think the immortality of the soul mm -hmm. all. Of, so the whole world <sighs> basically is mm -hmm. going to unite with the fountainhead of this power and authority, essentially coming from the American government mm -hmm. with the Pope at the head of all of that. Right. Mind you, this kind of violates the, uh, the constitution, but she makes a claim <laughs> that they're going to change it. So yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, I tell you anyway, but that's the biggest whopper of them all, you know, and again, it's under this title, American Prophecy, the Cosmic Conflict. I don't know where that one is. It's somewhere here. Um, Sometimes they'll know. give out the entire series, Conflict of the Ages series. It's go. a part of that with Patriarchs and Prophets and other books. Right. The whole nine, the whole nine. All right. So again, have these prophecies come to pass? No, and they're not gonna like just stop so <laughs> so yeah so all these so ellen White even fails their own makeshift prophecy uh a test of a prophet you know what i mean so like this you guys this this we could do this all day if we wanted to like it's 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 absolutely absurd um and here's the thing you know in actuality jeremiah 14 14 says this when the lord said to me then the lord said to me the pro the prophets are prophesying lies in my name i have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. How much more clear can you get? They use that as a footnote in that chapter from their exposition of fundamental beliefs, too, folks. It's unbelievable. Like, because I mean, sometimes they'll try to use the whole, well, the Old Testament standard doesn't apply to her. It's the new test. It's the New Testament standard of a prophet. That's one of the escape hatches I've heard some of them try to use. But again, in their exposition of their own fundamental beliefs, they even use Deuteronomy 18. Right. If it's someone like, comes claiming to be speaking on behalf of God, 
right. and does so falsely. And one, one single thing is all it takes. And it doesn't come That's to it. pass. <laughs> God says, don't even listen to this idiot. Right. Don't even listen. Don't fe He says, don't fear anything they say because they don't know what the heck they're talking about. There you go. There you go. You're ahead of me. There you go. <laughs> Right. Oh yeah. Sorry. I should have known that you were probably gonna bring that up. But uh, no, 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 that's 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 facts. And I mean, I, I want people to leave that there. I'll stop sharing my screen in just a second. But I want us to leave that there for effect. You know, like if the thing follows not or comes to pass, this is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. It's just that easy. Okay. So if you're going to say things like, oh, there's this coming and that did not happen. Right. And again, we've heard the nonsense about, well, Jonas prophesied the uh, the, uh, the the destruction of, of Nineveh and, and God uh, uh, didn't do it. So was Jonah yeah. a false prophet? You know, like we, we have dealt with that to death. OK, someone was, just brought that up right now. Alias. Oh, see, <laughs> I can't even see the, the, I the comments. To, I was about to ask you, do so you have a alias? Oh my God. My what, block what that why, why not, used uh, the Jonah okay, prophecy. Yeah. So what do you say to him? And I'll be in the background or her, whoever. All right. Okay. Well, what I would say is, is, is this, right? So Jonah is given a message by God to tell the people, right? It is up to God to say, you know what? I'm going to destroy you or not destroy you. The difference is that they cried out for mercy. Okay. They cried out for mercy, didn't they? And then God heard them. After they cried out for mercy and granted them mercy. Okay. And, um, some go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say, and, and, and here's the problem, folks, that you cannot lose sight of. Mm -hmm. They try to use this excuse across the board. Correct. What I read to you for an hour and 20 minutes was not the same as Jonah. No. Go and read Jonah. You can read it in like 12 minutes. I actually did it the other day because I heard this. Ex <laughs> Every time I hear this excuse brought up, I heard it in a Ted Wilson video. Oh. So I was like, okay, I'm going to read the book of Jonah again. Right. Because every time I hear this, I do this. Jonah went in and the whole Jonah's point is he obeyed God. Right. Jonah Definitely. did what he said he was going to do. And it revealed to him actually something about himself and his own heart. And God used it to also teach him a lesson, which mm -hmm. by virtue also teaches us a lesson. Jonah did not go in and say, I know for certain God's going to, God's not going to destroy you. And then God destroys them. The exact opposite happens, or it's a complete flop and a complete fa failure. What Ellen White said was, I was shown this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't happen. Correct. It's not the same. So they will point to something that was conditional, i.e. Jonah goes in and says, if you don't repent, you know, or God's going to destroy you guys. He wanted them to be destroyed. And then God relented because the people repented. And then Jonah was sad about it. It was an actual conditional prophecy. Right. They like to take actual conditional prophecies and try and say, anytime that there's difficulty, oh, well, that was a conditional prophecy. No, it wasn't. She straight up says, God showed me this is the case. Then a different vision comes along and it's like, oh, well, we were kind of wrong here. That's what the investigative judgment was born out of. We didn't talk about the first vision tonight, which is you didn't passing the narrow path. You can listen to that on YouTube, right. by the way, folks. Type in LNG White first vision. It's on the Hope 365 channel, which is Mark Finley, the assistant to the president of the Worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's just a lady reading the first vision. It's like 18 minutes. You can listen to that yourself. So let me just add one comment, guys, real quickly Do it. to confirm what the brothers are saying. <clears throat> let me read what Jonah says. Jonah 4, verses 1 to 3. And I'm getting old, guys. My throat's not what it used to be. Now, guys, Jonah 4, verses 1 to 3. And by the way, it's not about my ancestors, the Ninevites. Nineveh, yeah. the great Assyria. capital, Assyria. Mm -hmm. And the Assyrian church last week, there's two branches. They celebrated this <clears throat> mercy of God on the nation. Now, the other branch is celebrating this week. And today, Wednesday, is the final day. Anyway, guys, read this. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. This Jonah 4, verses 1 to 3. I'll make it quick. I just want to confirm what they're saying. <clears throat> Jonah exceedingly became angry. So he prayed to the Lord, Yahuwah, and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? What did you say? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful God, Slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, 
one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Yahuwah, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah 4, verses 1 to 3, tells you that Jonah knew that if God sent him to preach the Ninevites, they repented. God wanted them to repent so he could mm -hmm. save them, not destroy them. And Jonah knew it because he said, God, if you send me, they repent, then you're going to mm -hmm. forgive them. That's not what I want. Because look what he says here. Right. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Didn't I say that if they repent, you'll forgive them because you desire their salvation, not destruction, so it's not unconditional? You're using the threat of judgment to bring them to repentance because you want them to be saved because you love them? And I didn't want this because I hate them because what they do to us, because the Assyrians were a thorn in their side. And then I'll look what God says, and I'll end it with this. Same chapter. Same chapter, Jonah 4, that God's desire was to save them, not to destroy them. Let me just get you the verse. Mm. And he was going to, and if they didn't repent, he would destroy them. But because right. they repented, he wanted to save them. Look what he says. When God caused the gourd to miraculously mm -hmm. spring to give him shade, and then had a creeping thing, chew at the gourd, and then it withered, and the sun beat on him, and then Jonah started complaining. And then God says this, look, Jonah 4, verses 9 to 11. Watch here. And then I'm going to let you guys take it. I just want to confirm your point, because how pathetic and desperate to misquote the Bible to defend this false prophetess. Jonah 4, 9 to 11. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry <clears throat> about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord, Yahweh said, you have, you've had pity on the plant for which you have not labored. You didn't do anything to water it, plant a seed. It just grew up overnight by my power, right? Mm -hmm. Nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. Mm -hmm. And should I not pity Nineveh, yeah. that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? So you had pity for a gourd. But you had mm -hmm. no pity for more than 120,000 individuals oh who don't know the difference between their right hand, their left hand, and great cattle. You didn't want me to pity them? Your priorities are whack. But go ahead, guys. Yeah. You want to. Oh, man. Um, yeah. And, and if you don't mind, uh, Brother Sam, uh, there was a, co a comment I wanted to address real quick. Uh, Jen Phil, is that how you pronounce it? I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Villa Hermosa, maybe Villa Hermosa. All right, um, says uh, SDAs are begging the Protestants or the Pope, whoever, to impose Sunday law so the prophetess, uh, prophecy can be fulfilled, which will never happen because it's a false prophecy. That's facts, but you know what's the irony of ironies, right? Um, there is something that's called Liberty Magazine, okay? <laughs> it's Liberty Magazine, the whole point, and there's a, a religious liberty Sabbath that I think it's, I don't know if it's once a year or maybe twice a year, something like that, um, where the worldwide church collects offering uh, to go and help to promote religious liberty. What's religious liberty? Where they send people to either Washington or to kind of, as you know, not grease the palms. I don't want to make it sound bad, but they really were trying their best to say, you know what, let's stay, keep the separate uh, separation of church and state here because they don't want the Sunday law to be passed. They don't. Okay. And if, and let's say there was a Sunday law, let's just say that there was. Okay. If this is the catalyst that will uh, uh, be the, 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 the last stepping stone before Christ returns, wouldn't you want people to pass the Sunday law? We say we want to go to heaven yeah. and all this other stuff. Like, wouldn't it make more sense to be like, just hurry up and pass it so we can be done with this? You know? But time is winding up. It's always around the corner. You know, um, it's the sword of Damocles hanging over your head. You know but at I'm the saying? same time, CMB, Jesus could come at any moment. Any moment. Right? You know, it's ridiculous, man. Um, and this uh, this is uh, um, a bit of art that uh, uh, <laughs> answering Evans was talking about. So not only is uh, Jesus uh, showing Ellen White the Ark of the Covenant, and she can see the tab tablets of stone. Mind you, this is in heaven, by the way. So there's a physical ark in heaven. There's a physical, you know, tablet of stone with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were written on. Yeah. And she was amazed at the Fourth Commandment, 
uh, the very that God the wrote thing. with his finger because he has a corporeal form. Right, a physical literal. Finger. His literal finger is what they right. mean. The Ten Commandments That's are right. written with God's literal finger because he has a corporeal form. We covered that in the other session session. Yeah. So she says, "A soft halo of light encircling it," said the angel. <laughs> It's the only one of the ten which defines the living God who created the heavens and the earth and all things that they're in. You know, God is, in one philosopher's uh, uh, way of phrasing it, the greatest maximal being. Okay? God is omnipotent, omniscient. Um, He is greater than human minds can fathom. We can grasp hold of him. We can apprehend them. We may not be able to comprehend everything, but we can app- apprehend them. And they want to tell us that, Alan, the 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 fourth commandment defines God. Yeah, think about that for a minute. It's it's like the to them it is the it's like the identifying mark of the one true God. It's 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 unbelievable. Like I mean, oh boy. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I grew up with this. Um, like I said, I grew up in the church, love the church. Um, family's still in the church. Uh, friends, you know, um, people I've loved for my entire life. And it is it is mind-boggling. People, you know, on the outside say, oh, how can you believe this? Like, bro, I grew up in this. That's all I knew. That's yeah. literally all I knew. I mean, the way it works, folks, too, like the way that she functions is – yeah, I, I know that there are the different splinters out there. There's like the liberal SDAs. You get the type, the Adventist light, like, oh, we're Adventist, but we don't read Ellen White. But man, that is not the normative thing. The way it normally functions is you take the Sabbath school quarterly home each mm-hmm. week to prepare for the pinnacle of the day of the week, which is capping the week off with seventh day Sabbath, mm-hmm. including Sabbath school quarterly in your Sabbath school. Mm-hmm. The Sabbath school quarterly is mass printed and produced and sent out to the worldwide church to everyone to be studying this stuff. CMB, what is the predominant thing that you're reading in the Sabbath school quarterly? Okay. So um, whatever you read, it's always going to go back to Ellen White. How do we know this? Because the way it's divided up, um, it's divided up by days, right? So Sabbath afternoon, start your week, right? <laughs> Then yep. Sunday, then Monday, then Tuesday, then Wednesday, then Thursday. Um, Friday, um, which again, you know, we were notorious for doing our Sabbath school lesson on Friday nights because it got busy during the week. <laughs> and by the time that uh, pops up um, when you're doing your Sabbath school lesson, um, Friday evening is always with an Ellen White quote that you're supposed to kind of, um, and they don't say it like this, but this is kind of how it, how it kind of plays out in real time that you will be. Um, essentially meditating on her take on the whole topic of the week, you know, um, because she's the infallible to use the Sabbath school quarterly's own words. Infallible she's the infallible right? interpreter. How, how fortunate is the, uh, to quote the Sabbath school quarterly. I've done a video <laughs> on this folks, by the way, it's on my channel. Mm-hmm. How fortunate the Adventist church is to have the spirit of prophecy an infallible interpreter of scripture. Yeah. So their own magisterium. <sighs> Yeah, it's 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 um it's it's really and again the the whole point is that people say oh it's not like that it's not like that well again tell us where we got it wrong like yeah refute please. the claims refute the claims Feel come free. refute the claims I've had the challenge out for almost two months now on my okay. channel if okay. you think that we're misrepresenting in my case me hmm. come on to my show. Bring the the thing I'm taking out of context and we'll look at it. Hmm. I gave the resources tonight. You can go egwwritings.org. You can go back and listen to the playback of this and put in mm-hmm. the, just type in the, the source. If it's like evangelism, page right. 76, type that in. It'll pop right, right up and you can see the entire <laughs> book and the entire context for yourself. You see right. if we don't understand, like the Adventist church always wants to say about anyone who leaves that, we're bitter, we're angry. It's it's not even a possibility in their minds that <laughs> it's the theology. Not right. not even possible. Right. So it has to be that you're angry, you're bitter, you want to just go and live in your sin, etc. 
Yeah. You know, and I, I, I say this all the time, guys. And, you know, um, on my channel, I'll, I'll say this. Um, the, the biggest difference, I'd say, between um, us and those who are would stylize themselves as SDA apologists is that uh, they would say you shouldn't listen to former SDAs. Right? Yeah. What I say is, OK, don't listen to former SDAs. Go listen to them. Yeah. Go on their channels. Because we're former SDAs because of doing that. Right. <laughs> and, then, and then going and checking it with the Bible. Go check it out. Listen to Amazing Facts and tell me Doug Bastler preaches the gospel. Yeah. Okay. Go on any of these people's channels and you tell me that they're preaching the gospel. What they're preaching is and teaching all of them, without exception, all of them are teaching and preaching the great controversy, period. The three angels' messages. That's what it is. John the investigative Holmican, judgment, right? You you name it. That's that they're preaching. You know? The health message, all that. That's their gospel, folks. Their gospel includes vegetarianism. <laughs> that's a gospel issue in the Seventh Adventist Church. I have a video dropping next week, dedicated specifically to this. It's the right arm, my friend. <laughs> Part of their gospel is not yeah. the Trinity. No, it's not the Trinity, folks. You can be an Arian heretic. In this church, you won't be mm -hmm. excommunicated. You won't be put under church discipline. You mm -hmm. won't be corrected. In some of these circles, you'll be praised for being bold enough to be like the pioneers. Correct. You mm -hmm. can be an Aryan heretic. It's not a foundation in this church. Right. But you have to be down with the health message, the investigative judgment. And if you're not, you will be encouraged to do so. Mm -hmm. But also to be baptized, you're going to have to agree to these things as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I see a comment here says Mimi BB um, says, how long were you both in SDA? Um, you know, we were both born in it, but um, I was in for 25 years. Um, my, the last straw, um, I was about 25 when I left. So I, I, could, I couldn't do anymore. And I, I was been struggling um, uh, knowing that it was trash um, for about four to five years before that, no, about four years before that, 1999. And then I left in 04, 03, 04. I was in it for 13 years and then went through like a nominal phase where I mm -hmm. still would have said that I was like affiliated, but again, I was like nominal and then mm -hmm. returned again um, in like my young adult years from being like nominal to like s trying to be real serious. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take very long to yep. see um, <laughs> after being born again, I had a pretty radical conversion. Um, I, my initial pull was to go back to my tradition right. and I wanted to really now learn that a lot better and defend it out. And in the process of trying to do that, I realized this thing is a full blown cult. Mm -hmm. um, oh, good. Oh, you, listen, Aunt Nancy uh, asked an awesome question here. Uh, she says, why is it that most religious cults can use old King James English to claim it must be an ancient uh, and from God or his angels. So um, I'm personally not King James only. I have no problem with the King James Version. But I'll tell you why the SDA uh, church has to use the King James Version for um, for their pillar doctrines. All right. So yep. specifically um, the 1844 doctrine. Uh, what's up? Genesis 2-7. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you have to do that. You have to use Daniel, uh, King James, uh, Daniel eight fourteen to get um twenty three hundred uh, days as opposed to evenings and mornings. Yep. Um, which is what the the term is in the Hebrew Arab Booker. Um, up to two thousand three hundred days in the sanctuary will be cleansed. That's what it says in King James, but uh, Arab Booker should be translated as evenings, mornings. So um, that's the way, funny enough, that's the way it's translated every place else in that same chapter and yep. most other places in the book. <laughs> Which, Sam, you mentioned James Snap earlier. That would be a great discussion to have with him. Getting into, I don't know what his familiarity is with biblical languages, but getting yeah. into that specific point about Daniel 814, because that is a doozy yeah. for their church. Um, but I saw that question earlier from Sal. Um, which Sal, that song that you made of Sam in that last video was hilarious. Yes, yes, yes. Sal Racinos is the guy who made that hit piece of me going a lot of snack bar, a lot of snack bar. Now, before you get to his question, you have no more slides, brother. You're no, I'm good. Um, at yeah. the moment, like I said, I, I, could, I could, like I've done, I don't know how many shows I've done this over the last uh, so uh, six or seven years. So I got slides for days. Um, yeah, yeah. For this particular one, that was it. Because if you guys want, yeah. back again, 
my channel is always open. Mm -hmm. If you want to come back next week, I'm hoping you guys go viral and you take off because your voices are needed. I had not known. <clears throat> God started revealing to me when I say reveal, not like Ellen G. White. I'm not a prophet. I wasn't taken to the to heaven. So when I say reveal, <laughs> God made known to me that Seventh Day Adventism was a dangerous satanic cult. I think it was over two years ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't rewatch my older sessions, but Miles watched it, where a man reached out to me. He goes, I want to tell you about the dangers of SDA theology. So I brought him on. I was blown away. Why? Because you mentioned it earlier today, and he mentioned in the previous sessions, I had been duped into thinking by the kingdom of the cults mm -hmm. that the right. Seventh-day Adventist movement was a legitimate movement. Mm -hmm. The Walter Pass. But <laughs> then, but then I had not paid attention to Walter Martin's debate I knew there was a debate on the John mm. Ankerberg show yep. with a seventh day Adventist represented, but I never paid attention to that. Mm. It was when Miles mentioned it, that that's when Walter Martin, actually, when he found out that this is an evil heretical cult, he actually went for the juggler and that a series of exchanges with that representative. So I didn't know that for all mm. this time. I thought, well, Hey, Walter Martin was an expert and he gave them a pass. So they must not be, heretical but thank god it's now coming to the forefront and with that said do they appeal to walter martin to try to defend themselves <laughs> oh, all day every day I, dude, twice so it's day. called we call it the walter pass <laughs> they love doug bachelor loves to bring that up i just heard him say that the yeah. video wasn't from it was from like three years ago yeah. but he was given one of his so sam you asked about doug bachelor the last time i was on here <laughs> and i i went back and i watched that stream and i realized i kind of I went in a lot of directions on that stream. Um, I was just overwhelmed <laughs> with trying to give as much information as possible, but I never really explained the whole like hierarchy of their church. And Doug is the salesman type. Oh, he's right. not the, he's not built like they're not going to get him for their SDA Bible commentary. I saw some right. guy comment earlier that was like, Doug Batchelor is a, is a labeled as like a theologian. Not really. He's labeled as an apologist and a pastor in the SDA church. He is a really good orator who presents the public like surface level flyover. We're just like the rest of Protestants. We just, mm -hmm. you know, we have a few distinctives just like every Protestant denomination. Right. <laughs> You're not going to hear the granular level things. That's why CMB and EJ and I did the two streams that we did responding to one of those public presentations. My point being is um, he, he publicly presents adventism as like the salesman type he is the the seller of the product and he's able to package it in such a way that he's able to sell it and really get people's buy-in yeah um and to go back to Walter martin real quick um so like and, and we kind of talk about this uh in some detail i did uh and again shameless plug for decal apologist as well um check out the the video called the top five um uh fundamental beliefs of the sda on the BK Apologist channel. Um, I have it uploaded onto my, um, or a, 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 a link anyway to his, um, on a playlist on my channel called SDA Factor Fiction. Um, there's like over a hundred and some videos on there, not all from me, yeah, just from different me people. Link. Okay, yeah. Send me the links to yeah. all the channels so I can put them in the description box. Okay. And also I'll pin it as a comment because I was trying to figure out the name of your channel and I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. So I need your links and okay, share gotcha. them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna send it to you now, but um, yeah. So uh, when it comes to Walter Martin, you know the the church did lie, you know, um, about what they were about, and Walter Martin, in the spirit of Christian brotherhood, was like, okay, well, I'm not gonna call them a, a outright cult. What I will do is put a, a, them in um an appendix. So if you go to the K Kingdom of the Cults book now, okay, um, they're in an appendix in there. So he doesn't say that they're a cult. But he also does not recommend them for, for anyone joining their church. Okay. Um, they released a book called Questions on Doctrine right, yeah. as a result of this and then took it out of print. Mm -hmm. It was their yep. PR campaign in response to the big hubbub with all of this. Mm -hmm. And it was just a cover up job because the issue that Martin had, which Sam, we talked about this the last time, is they pulled the wool over his eyes because they didn't define terms. They're yeah. really good at using all the same language. So in your mind, you're thinking the correct thing, but that's not what they mean. Like I mentioned right. earlier, the faith of Jesus. Well, that sounds noble. It's not what you think it is. 
Righteousness by faith. It's not what you think it is. They do that with every term. So they were able to pull the wool over his eyes. And then when he realized it, that's when he went nuclear at the John Akerberg show because he was right. like, these people fooled me and that's not okay. Right. Well, I'll just tell you how bad this deception was. <clears throat> David Wood, a while back, and I want you to review that. All you guys review that. And then, if, mm -hmm. like I said, you can come back next week. Whatever topic you think is important for you to get out there because you need to be on more channels so that people can be aware of your material. And well, I'll do my part to promote it. But just want you to guys find this video. <clears throat> David Wood did a video because Nabil Qureshi, the late Nabil Qureshi, <clears throat> was an Ahmadiyya Muslim. Ahmadiyya Muslims are considered heretics by traditional Muslims. Why? Because in the 19th century, 1800s, an Indian Muslim reformer named Murza Ghulam Ahmed came forward <clears throat> to debate the Christian missionaries and to defend Islam. So he first claimed to be a reformer. Then he claimed to be a prophet after Muhammad. Then he claimed to be the Messiah that Muhammad said was returning. Because in the Hadiths, narrations attributed to Muhammad, the Sunni collection, the Shia, Shia agree, Jesus is returning. Jesus. They're Esau, they say Jesus. He said, no, that's misunderstood. What Muhammad was saying is someone who will come in the likeness and spirit of Jesus, and that's me. Hmm. So his, <clears throat> him and his followers were condemned as heretics. Nabil Qureshi was raised in that movement. So when he became Christian, mm -hmm. the Orthodox Muslims called him out saying, you were never a true Muslim. Why don't you tell the people the facts that your sect, the Ahmadiyya sect, is condemned? You're not part of mainstream Islam. So David Wood did a video trying to explain and defend that though Ahmadiyya Islam believe in Murza Ghulam Ahmed, they hold to enough tenets to be considered Sunni Muslims. And he likened it to this argument. He goes, if you can accept seven-day Adventists as wow. a segment <laughs> within Protestant Christianity, though they believe in L.G. White, then that means you should have no problem viewing the Ahmadiyya sect who's talking to Christians here, as also being part of Islam, though they believe in a prophet after Muslim Ghulam Ahmed. And I said, hey, David, wow. what a good argument. Because at that time, I thought Seventh-day Adventism could be given a pass. Right. But wow. now that argument means it is a bad <laughs> argument because it ends up proving that right. Ahmadi Islam should be condemned by Orthodox Muslims like we should condemn Seventh-day Adventism. So I yep. think you guys right. should review it and give a commentary. You can do it on my channel or you can do it on your channel and I'll sh share the link. Yeah, anytime. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> so guys, it's already been two hours and 30 minutes. Please, all of you, I'm going to be taking their links and I'm going to be putting them in the description box and pin them. Take all these sessions, upload them, translate them, clip them. You got my permission. You guys don't need to ask me, especially the, the two brothers. It's their material. So Lord yeah. willing, you guys reach out to me. You can come back next week if you want. Bring in more folks. Bring in, I want all of you guys. Do whatever you think. It is the most salient issue that all Trinitarian Christians who love and worship the true triune God need to know, even though I understand that from your particular tradition, some of these other traditions may not be completely in line with Scripture, but at least they're being gracious enough to agree to disagree and help them. Because Patristic Pillars, he's a Catholic apologist, and he wants you on. So he's he will be more than happy to have you come I'll on. Email you. I'll email you, William. All right. So, Lord willing, any final comments, and then we'll wrap it up. And maybe one of you brothers can end in prayer and then pray for my throat. I'm not as young as you guys. Better looking, but not as young. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ is king. This movement is a false cult. It's not Christian. Adventists out there, you need to face the music. It's time to get honest about this. This is a false gospel. This is a false God. It's a yep. false Christ. I know that this is not commonly said in the Adventist bubble. That's why there are people like us that are saying this, who are bold enough to now tell you the truth. We're not angry. We don't hate Seventh-day Adventists. We're willing to be firm and bold enough to tell you the honest truth. You need to really start examining these things 
and stop being so fearful of history and tradition and a lot of these other things and simply go wherever the facts lead. Go wherever the, fa wherever the facts lead. If you can watch the, the stuff we talked about tonight and you just look at it with an objective lens, there's zero excuse and reason to remain in this cult. Amen. Amen. Um, and I just want to say this real quick. I was, I was going to um, kind of plug a few places. Um, the Brother Solo Scriptura 21 was on earlier, so shout out to him. Check him out. Test the Prophet. Check him out. Um, former Adventist podcast, check them out. They're amazing. Colleen Tinker, Lickie, Nikki Stevenson. I've never These met them. These are all them, former Adventists. Right? Right? <laughs> They're amazing. Uh, EJ Thunderlorston, of course. Um, Dr. Steve Daly, he's on Facebook. Um, check out his book, uh, um, The Psychobiography, and uh, EJ's books, um, Hiding in Plain Sight. He also has two other um yeah, two other books. So all three volumes of Hiding in Plain Sight and two additional books. Um, AC Theologian uh, as well, too. So check them out. Um, and there are a plethora more out there. Okay. Um, please feel free to check those, uh, uh, those folks out there. And I say all that to say this. Um, I don't hate the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. The system is corrupt and it's, and it's garbage. Okay. You can't have it anymore. It's not in line with Christ. Um, and I love you enough to tell you that. Okay. Um, and my, my catchphrase when I tell when I end my shows uh, is this, that I love you with the love of Christ, even if I disagree with you. Um, and I pray and hope that um, you will uh, get objective, you know, go back through the books um, on your own, go through the fundamental beliefs on your own and compare them with scripture. All right. Um, for those who are not seven day Adventists, go check out these people that we talked about, go look at their stuff. And you tell me that that's gospel that they're preaching. You know? And understand that this movement uh, is so bigger than both. Um, at least on paper, this movement is bigger than both Mormonism and mm -hmm. Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, they're more influential because of Walter Martin's influence, yeah. I think. It's given them a platform in Correct. the world. Yeah. For example, mm -hmm. you have Doug, ba uh, Doug Batchelor's Amazing Facts on TBN. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I don't, I'm not aware of TBN hosting any Mormons or Joe's Witnesses, are you? Nope. Mm -hmm. And we're mm -hmm. not going to get into this, obviously, because we're closing down, but even their hospitals. It's not just about yeah. medical care, folks. Mm. See, so their hospitals, know. their schools, all of this stuff, their health, their end times uh, seminars, their John uh, Bradshaw, it is written, end times seminars, mm -hmm. their health seminars, all yeah, these the tactics ministries, that they yeah. have, mm -hmm. they come into your town and city and they oftentimes won't put their name on these things. And they're slowly proselytizing people with a lot of. Uh, conspiracy theories and things about the Sunday law and getting people fearful and jumping ship and coming to join them. 